Thank you for tuning in to the Seabros Fishing Podcast. On this episode, we're excited to host Captain Brett Wilson of Hindsight Sport Fishing based out of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Over the past few years, we've had the pleasure of becoming friends with Brett both on and off the water. Brett is a great captain with decades of fishing experience under his belt, and in our opinion, he runs one of the most professional and well-respected charter operations in the Northeast. Brett is a second-generation fisherman. His father had a fishing charter boat out of Rock Harbor, Mass. for over 20 years. He started as a mate on his father's boat at the age of 10 and progressed to working on several different charter boats as a kid. At the age of 18, Brett received his captain's license. With license in hand, Captain Brett headed to the Florida Keys where he furthered his career mating for some of the best captains in the world. In 2010, Brett started hindsight sport fishing charters aboard his 42-foot Duffy Down East boat. He runs over 150 trips a year with a stacked roster of returning clients and anglers. Overall, Brett puts in over 200 days per year on the water. During the winter months, he captains fishing charters in Florida and is also hired to run several sport fish boats in the sailfish tournament circuit. Brett is simply a savage. Taylor and I have admired his approach to charter fishing and tuna fishing since we were young. In this conversation, we discuss some great topics and Brett shares some incredible stories. Everything from hand feeding grander bluefin tuna on George's bank, tournament fishing for sailfish down in Florida, scary experiences and lessons learned on the water, hunting stories, and much more. We had a blast and learned a ton. We hope you enjoy this podcast as much as we did. Stay tight. Welcome to the Sea Bros Fishing Podcast, where we follow three words of wisdom. You can't catch them if you don't have a hook in the water. Always trust your instincts. And the last, you'll just have to keep listening. Stay tight. Yeah, this stuff's always fun. Everybody that's never done a podcast, they always finish and they're like, that was the easiest thing I ever did. Well, I, I mean, it's a, it's a weird thing it, to like do for the first time. It's funny. I've been asked to, you know, obviously you guys, and then I got asked to do one with uh, Bill Fish Group down oh, in yeah. Florida and all that stuff. And, you know, those guys have been kind of touching on me a little bit, you yeah. know, because Nick was a, he was a, uh, he was a guy that I trained when I was younger and, you know, he's been, become very successful and stuff like that. So you know, this is the new new way of doing stuff, you know. I haven't been asked to do them, and then boom, all of a sudden I got a couple, you know, to do. So yeah. It's been, uh, and once you're on a few, everybody's going to ask you. Every fishing podcast. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you I, know. I don't know about that. But. Well, as far as offshore fishing, like if they like how you sound, yeah, you'll be asked to be on them. Well, we'll see where, see where it all takes us. Sure, it'll be great. Tell some stories and, you know gain a little knowledge along the way and, and kind of go from there. But yeah, I mean, that, that's the biggest part of things is, is the fact that, um, you know, all of a sudden it's just like, I, you know, I, I still work at an extremely high pace and I don't feel like I've lost any of my edge. Like as far as like going fishing, I can go fishing seven days a week for six months and yeah, I'm going to be tired, but, but all of a sudden it's like, you sit back and like, man, how did I get old? Like, you know, this is this is a young man's game now, and you see all the you guys up and comers, and you know, kind of, you know, you guys have got a big name for yourselves now too, and all that stuff, and it, it's it's cool to see. But you know, I'm like the guy, and I'm not washed out by any means, but I, you know, I'm just kind of like the guy on the. Dude, on the you're not washed out. I'll tell you right now, as far as your, like what you put off your professionalism, I've admired it since like you were crushing it at George's bank from like the beginning of that whole thing. Like I was creeping on your website like every oh, yeah. day, just like, cool. yeah. Some of those initial George's videos were insane. Insane. Man, you know, you talk about George's bank and, you know, like I, I was one of the original five. Like it wasn't me that like kind of discovered it, but I, I was in the group and this guy named Bobby St. Pierre, who he's, he's moved on. He's dead. Um, he passed away probably like seven or eight years ago, but he was a, uh, he was a ground fish guy out there on George's, 
Um, but he was also tuna fishing me in a harpoon boat and all that stuff. And, you know, we were just kind of feeling our way around. We'd never been out there. It's a huge place out there. And it's like, how do you, you know, it's 30 feet deep when we're 150 miles off. Like, all right, we got to stay away from that. That's but, crazy. Um, but he's like, no, there's this ground fish spot that he's like, I'm going to go check it out. And it was like when we first got there, we had caught some fish in shore. Um, well, not it's really inshore, but like 10 miles west of there, closer to home. And he's like, yeah, you guys got to come out here. And it was just like the most epic thing you've ever seen. Like that first year, there was a biomass that lived there. It was a biomass of fish. And we would, <laughs> it's just funny, like, you know, oh, shit, I'm marking one, I'm marking one. And it's like, no, dude, don't even, you keep going, you mark like 60 or 80. And then what we were doing, and this is a kind of a trick that I learned in Florida, uh, just right, snapper fishing in Florida. And I'm taking a snapper fishing thing and I'm turning it around on the 800 pound tunas. So what we would do is like, we'd, I'd slow down and then you'd mark keep marking keep marking and granted we're not fishing traditional way with you know we're not drifting with floaters and all that stuff at this stage of the game there's too many fish there so just sitting there and we, we call it the circle of death you know and we i put the boat in a hard turn because all those fish out there were used to those you know the scallopers and all that stuff so the more noise the better so we were banging stuff around and i put the boat in, in a hard turn at like 1500 rpm and I do like 10 circles and I have my mate shoveling herring over the back of the boat and we'd fire one in there. And I can't tell you how many times we were tight before the foam had cleared the, boat. the prop wash, the prop wash. That's and it was just going in hard circles. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing it for like three minutes just to get some stuff really sinking down. Cause there, there were fish freaking everywhere. That's so sick. And, uh, but yeah. And then you get, you know, it was three a day and phew, we'd be done. Were you guys fishing, like, did it vary day to day, like shoal versus edge versus deep water? It was you know, pretty that, much the same. That first year was 2010. That's when everything kind of got discovered to the point where we're not catching anything in shore. Like, there was no fish. Like, we didn't even fish Cape Cod Bay for, like, 10 years. Mm. After the Saners had cleared everything out. Remember like, how slow it was. It was yeah. awful. That, that whole system, man, look, look at it now. I mean, we're looking at something. We're just going to flash back to Cape Cod Bay here real quick because as we, we all spent a lot of time in the bay or, or in adjacent areas and all that stuff. And and when those guys came in there and they wiped out and took all those tunas out of there, like all these tunas are, that were these 105, 110 inches, they're 15 to 20 year old fish. So the cycle in the bay has been has replenished itself since the the, um, the persaners had left. But I mean, there was literally 10 years where we didn't fish in the bay. Yeah. Now I grew up fishing in inside the bay, and I caught my first one when I was 15, and you know it's a vivid memory, and it changed my life that day forever we hooked a double down off the fingers off a of barnstable that's sick and i seen the fish come out of the you know come up to the back of the boat and i'm 15 dude i'm like i don't know i'm just like <laughs> oh my god I, I was frozen i couldn't i couldn't do anything and the guy's screaming at me harpoon and i'm like i don't even know which end to throw at this thing right now and but it changed my life but it was one of those things like i was running the boat out that particular day and and, and the, the guy had, he caught some tunas before and all that stuff but it was just like i knew it Today was the day. Like, yeah. I we we left, we went out, and I'm like, no, today's it. Like, hundred percent in my head, and then we hooked a double, and of course we lost one. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing, and he knew a little bit about what he was doing, but we got the one out of the whole thing. But anyway, that whole cycle of things, like inside the bay, and how, you know, how it got wiped out, and that's how we ended up on George's because those fish have always been on George's, but nobody's ever had to go out there yep. during that time. And then now it's just like reinventing ourselves. Like that first year, I was just, um, it was actually the year that I bought the boat. Um, I ran it since 07, and it was 2010 that I got the boat. So and you ran it for, did you run it for someone else for a few years? Yeah, yeah I ran it for a buddy of mine. He and I used to fish together. Paul Polanski is the guy's name. Um, we fished together on, um, his old boat. He had a 44 Jersey, you know, not really the ideal tuna boat by any means, yeah. big Detroits and, you know, twin screw and all that stuff. And we caught a bunch of fish and we did that for a few years. And then we just decided that we'd be better friends if we each had our own boat. Yeah. And so I went and bought an H and H I had a 40 H and H that was my first rig. And he had built the stuffy in 2002. 
the, the boat that I own now. Mm-hmm. And he ran it for, I think, five years and married kids, doors, and then he couldn't do it with the boat. He needed a regular like nine to five job, mm-hmm. you know, because of the girls and all that stuff. So I ran the boat for him and he was in the process of selling it and. You know, people would come by. I'm like peeing on the boat in the corner, so nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> just so I can, you know, just so I can, you know, kind of keep it keep it for myself for a little bit longer. And the intentions in the beginning were not to buy it because, um, like '08, we were in a hard recession back back then. Yeah, and it was not like it wasn't even in my head. Now we were catching some fish. Um, thing, things had picked up a little bit you know we were we were killing like 25 30 a year type of thing but we were doing our our summertime charters and you know trying to rebuild that part of the business yeah because the tunas are a wild card we didn't know what was happening um i had not caught a tuna yet um before we went to georgia's and we went to georgia's it was september or i think we left on august 31st or something and it's wide open then, you know, we don't have open and closed days, you know, everything's just wide open and it was three a day. And I had not caught a tuna. I hadn't really spent a whole lot of time. We caught some wreck fish and stuff like that. And Bobby went out there with Sean and there was, he, those guys were the original two, but I was part of like the original five. And we had like, we got like six or eight trips in before everything really started catching on. But so flash forward, it's August 31st. And I had not caught a tuna yet for the year. That's crazy. So how many days did you try though? Um, I don't really remember exactly how many times I tried. We were, you know, we were catching some wreck fish and stuff with charters, but I was just at, you know, because of the way everything had been, like we're going, we're kind of jumping around here a little bit, but right. you know, I, I bought my boat, I bought the H and H and I think in Oh five is when I, no, no, it was Oh two because he had the boat built in Oh two. And we still fish together. We were networked together and all that stuff. Um, and fishing was great. Had it. Like, you know, I was living on the boat up in Maine. I was just a kid. Like, I didn't have anybody to come home for. So I just lived on the boat, anchored up. And, you know, we were whaling on these things at nighttime. Nobody really knew what was kind of going on. And then that finally caught on. And, um, you know, but that first year I, I killed, I sold 60 fish. So... Back then, it was worth a lot. We were going, we were fishing out of Portland. Fuel was 89 cents a gallon. Like, Jesus. and it's just like so much was changing over, over this short time span where we were catching them and then all of a sudden everything was just kind of gone. And it's part of a bigger cycle. I don't think that we really know about like this probably happens all along, whether we're here wailing on these things or whatever storm may be. But so, you know, there's a greater circulation of what what happens and 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 all that stuff that none of us know yeah, about the biomass shift that we just theorize about right yeah i mean you look at the herring and all that stuff and then but there's still no fish mm-hmm. you know you had the bait was there but the fish weren't there um anyway i'm getting sidetracked um about it this is so anyway it, it was one of those things we're, we're kind of going backwards and away from georgia's at the moment but so that first year i killed 60 it was a lot of money it was 230 grand roughly and i was a kid like i was 23 years old dude and trust me i blew it i didn't do anything right, <laughs> <laughs> anything right. i had a great time but i didn't yeah. do any of it right and it was like within five years everything had collapsed you couldn't catch fish and you know the price was still up but you couldn't catch anything so what was the point? So that's what the, where the focus of the charter business kind of comes into play. So, and over that time, like I started running the boat for him. I sold my, I had to sell that boat within five years because I couldn't make a living at it. I'm like, what happened? Like it was so good for, in the beginning. And this is like a five year span. Like we're just wailing on these things and psh, gone, they're gone. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to catch. And I don't say, when I say they're gone, they're not gone, but we're down to catching like 15 fish a year or something like that. And yeah. that's not going to, that's, that's not, not going to pay the bills. That's not going to pay the bills. So we move, move forward to 2007 and seven, yeah, 2007. And that was when, you know, I started running the boat for, for Paul. Um, the name of the boat was Captain Cook back then. And so I ran it for him and like, Paul was great. He's a good friend of mine. He just, he just turned his head and, and went to do his thing and just left everything for me to handle, which was great. 
I didn't have him in my ear barking. I'm like, well, you can't do this or you can't do that. Like he's like, go do it all. You know? Awesome. Um, so, um, that's the initial year where I started building that, that charter business back up. Like, cause he was so inconsistent because of the the girls and the divorce and you know, blah, blah, blah. So that was the initial part. And then, so that was more of my focus. And then we get back to 2010 and yeah, you're asking about how many, how many days did you fish? Yeah. Well, it was more for wreck fish. Remember, it was really hard for us too. And, and, yeah. and charters and stuff like that. Like there was fish around, but right. not much. Yeah, you get little ones. Yeah, a lot of, there was a lot. There was of a little bit of a spark, I feel like, that started that year. Like we were seeing like a lot of 70 inch class, like bigger yeah. wreck fish that 70s. year. We were bringing pogies out that year. There wasn't much bait on the bank. Yeah. Um, Somebody but like it wasn't there. good, but I feel like if we were to if we were to kind of refer back to the last 10, 15 years, that's kind of when it just started to go. It was back starting up. to go. And then yeah. like, you know, we were I was living on the hill I and mean, Peaked Hill was it, you know, there's there's just I mean that's where we lived this year too. Yeah. It was, it's a good spot, especially for all of us doing their charters with the stripers and if you drift, you know, you can stop and literally one stop shop and get everything right yep. there. Um, so that's, that was the cool part about that. But yes, it, they were all like 70, 71 inches. You couldn't, you know, yeah. you couldn't do much with them. And I think there was a short period of time where we couldn't even kill those fish or something. I feel like it was thing. a weird slot limit. I it was, think it was like, was that like some 63 or something like that? Yeah. It was one fish or something for yeah, a while. Weird. And then, yeah. So anyway, I don't know exactly how it was, but, um, was it, I can't remember. Was it nothing over 47 to under 73 at one point? I for think couple so. Of years? It could have been it what was, it was. I think it was yeah. during that time. I feel like yeah. you couldn't even keep keep them. And it sucked because like you're sitting there like... Right. Ah. We were getting like 72, three and a half. So remember yeah. we were pulling them to the door and measuring like yeah. three, and bait, four bait fish. was real tough back then. Yes. Too. And yeah. you know, here's a, here's a cool story. You guys will get a kick out of this. Like... We would we were tied up in P Town. Like I'll have you know, and it's kind of morphed to kind of what I do today, where I just move the boat and you know. But I had these groups that come in for three or four days at a shot, and you know we're just tuna fishing the whole time, and bait was tough. You couldn't catch mackerel. You know you're using whiting. You know you just didn't have like high quality bait. So we're tied up in Provincetown, and all those squid were in P Town, and they're I mean they're all like 12, 15 inches long, and we just we're just putting them in the tank like i don't know like i've caught a few like you know maybe a couple of tunas at this point yeah. you know like on squid and squid is literally my favorite bait to use yeah by the way now like as as i've gotten older but so here we are we're we're anchoring up on the hill and then obviously there's a lot of current there especially when you're anchoring up and you know we got a blue fish out and then you know you but the you know you're there's no real, there's not that many big fish around. So, you know, you, you know what you're going to get when one eats a blue fish. Right. But you've got charters and stuff on the boat. So you've got to, you know, reinvent yourself here a little bit. So here I am. I'm, you know, this, and, and this is part of my, you're going to get a kick out of this. This is part of my thing with, you know, Florida and kite fishing and all that stuff. So I'm like, well, we're going to try something. I told the crew this. I'm like, we're going to try something here today, guys. I don't know how it's going to work. So we put, we're putting squid in the kite. And that's sick. And we we had we'd have two kites out, you know, just to kind of keep stuff so st spread out, just making yourself as big as you possibly can. I'm like, I don't know how this is gonna work. And I look over there, and you know, I mean, I'm like trying to figure out how we're gonna be able to keep the squid alive. And I have like a six ounce sinker above the swivel just to help keep enough weight because the squid doesn't so weigh light. a whole lot. Yeah. And um, all of a sudden, I just I see the squid going and boom, piles on it. I'm like, this thing hasn't been out for five minutes i'm like you gotta be kidding me like and we just wailed on that's them. sick we, dude we wailed on them and it was just it was it was it was a cool thing like hey you gotta try stuff right you oh, yeah. keep trying it and reinventing yourself and like you know i'm i don't want to say i'm self-taught because i had a little bit of help from from a few people and they threw a few, little bit at me but they're like now nah, you're gonna do this on your own but i, I kind of moved up the ladder pretty quickly and, and figured stuff out and integrated some of my stuff with florida in as well as uh you know catching our tunes here. that's so. huge the fact that you've uh and we can we'll touch on florida and, yeah, and that whole game things. in a bit but like they're live bait masters down there you yeah. know so taking taking bits and pieces of that i'm sure was like shot you right up there well skill wise i mean with these and, things. and you know i can keep you know i haven't been keeping 
like I got sea chests in multiple wells and all that stuff on my boat now, especially when we're doing nothing but tuna fishing for like 30 days straight. And we're basically booked every single day, whether it'll kind of play a factor in yeah. some of it. But I have, I, I had pogies in the well for five weeks, five weeks. They swam around in that well. It's and, insane. I mean, you couldn't even hardly catch them. They were snow white. So that made it even better when the tuna was coming across, you yeah. know. But we would just, you know, just like, hey, this is we're going to use our, our four baits. If we're fishing four pogies, we're going to use those four. Leave the because we bridle everything. Yeah, and I said leave the bridles in there so we know which one's which, and that way we're not digging around and scooping up a whole bunch yep. of bait and all that stuff at all time. So, learning a lot of that stuff from Florida and the live bait scene, yeah, it's definitely it's, it's definitely huge. killed a few tunas. That's why you can fish gorilla gear all the time because your bait's fucking money all the time. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that that is part of it, you know. Like, oh, the guy fishes, you know, he fishes heavy leader and they're short and all that stuff, and I think we still get. There's that. been so many times where like we're sitting there, like whether I'm fishing with Jeff or Taylor and I are fishing together, we're running separate charters, or like it's fucking slow, and then I swear to God, we're all like. Brett fishes fucking 10 foot leaders. Dude, really, we say it all the time. They're just not biting right now. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny. I mean, we, we, we take pride in what we do. And like, you know, it's like the young mates that I'm teaching along the way and bringing them up. Like, they go put some bass gear out. I mean, I have a totally different demeanor. I'm like, oh, we're going to, you know, troll these sabils or whatever like that. But it's like when the tunes and things come out, I'm like, everything is wiped. Everything is goes into a bucket. Like, yeah, don't screw with my shit. Yeah. Like, once you learn how to do this, and once I show you this to you a few times, this is how you do it, and that's that's that. Yeah. There's no other way. Yeah. Don't even try to, you know, and, you know, you get some chippy kids. Well, you know, I can, no. See you later. It's like, it's a confidence thing in yourself, but it's also just keeping the same system every day. You're going to be more productive. You do it the same every fucking time. You're going to be much better. Yeah. Certain things, the same, same, but you, you might have to like, you know, you go and fish different areas. And yeah, you gotta, yeah, yeah. You got to use different bait and you're, you're anchored up and, you know, 200 feet and you're trying to fish pinnacle and you're, you're fishing baits really deep. But, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of different stuff that is constantly changing. And I feel like I'm a, I'm a guy that, you know, I'm not claiming myself to be, you know, or pat myself on the back, but I can probably go anywhere and catch one. Like whether I'm anchored up in, in, you know, deep water up in Maine, or we're trolling out east, or we're fishing in the bay, or you know, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm the best at it, but I feel like I could. Yeah, you're well could, versed. Totally, I, I could acquire. You're very get, consistent. Get some bites, you know. Yeah, caught them all the way up and down. I've caught them in Florida. Sick. Have you like successfully landed them on light gear down there? One. One. <laughs> I've seen How many some of you of... Oh shit! I don't know. <laughs> But, you know, that whole day, we'll, we'll touch on that real quick, too. Like, we were fishing a sailfish tournament. It was a tournament that day. It was a... Tell me you stopped in the middle of the tournament to catch bluefin. <laughs> no, the, 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 this, get, out this, this gets better. No, no, no. We were, we were just, you know, we just had our yeah. gear out. And, yeah. you know, I uh, the boat that I was running was a walk-around boat. And the day before, there was a whole bunch of fish that got caught, like, 20 miles away. And I'm on a charter boat, like dude we're not going down there like everybody's gonna go racing down i said we're gonna go right out front and fish the wrecks right here and we were catching sails and you know, all of a sudden you see a couple of big explosions off in the distance well there was a body of them moving through and all of a sudden boom right long because we're fishing three baits on the on, a, on one side of the kite and all that stuff and i'm like mm, i don't know if this one's a sail you know <laughs> And the only reason I think we were able to get it to the boat was it was like an 80 inch fish and he was so derelict. Like he was, you know, just been traveling and just, it yeah. was, it wasn't a strong fish and we got him up to the boat and, uh, we got a good look at him and grabbed the leader and it was only a 30 pound leader yeah. and just popped him off. And I'm like, can't kill him. He was like, Hey, just try to get a picture. Um, but on top of that, we won the sale tournament. No That's way. Sick. That's awesome. We that's think we really caught cool. seven seven sails that day and and the and the bluefin, but that's cool. Um, so circle back just to keep it in chronological order. Yep. So twenty ten is where we left off. We're kind of starting to see a slight creep in the fishery, and then this is when like you make the pivot from partner running the duffy to owning owning the duffy. Owning the duffy yep. Yep. And we had caught some fish like inshore down off of Chatham in the fall and stuff like that prior to 2010. But 2010 was like, it was like there was nothing and nobody could catch anything mm -hmm. inshore, like of any great amounts, you know. So boom, 
here we go. We're going 140 off. Like, don't know where we're going, but I'm going with people that have a clue. And, and, um, but anyhow, that, that, that turned into a whole nother thing. And that season, when I told you I hadn't caught one and we still ended up with 60. We made from one, August. So August 31st, just on to August 31st. And November we, we fished it? till just before Thanksgiving. Fuck. Jesus. Yeah. You were just turned and burning. We made 20 trips and I had my limit every time. And sometimes, you know, you're there for a few hours. Sometimes you were there. I had one time that I was there for six days. And, and But I think that was that was not 2010 because they were just biting really good in 2010. I think it was the following year, like 11, and everybody's just like, oh, strapping on their helmets and we're going to go live on George's Bank. I've seen 100 boats there. No way, really. I've seen 100 boats What was the boats smallest on boat you saw there? Well, people were towing their boats out there and yeah, stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we'd see 20-foot Makos and stuff, but, you know, and they would be zipping around while they're there, but, you know, they were, they had a mothership somewhere. Yeah. Hmm. But, so anyway, that that particular, I think it was 2011 when it was tough, and it was just like everybody had it in their head that this is, you know, this is, they're there. There are just so many of them there all the time. Well, that's not the case. I mean, they're... There generally is fish. There's always some fish, but and were they on those cod primarily, or was there a biomass, a herring mass? The, the bait else? spot, the bodies of bait were huge. They were everywhere. Yeah. I mean, there's mackerel, there's herring, um, the cod, you know, and you know, a lot of people that didn't really um, want to stray too far, they would just stay there in that cod hole. Yeah, and you, you it was consistent. You would pick them out, and I trust me, I caught a lot of fish in that spot too, but. When you got 30 boats, 40 boats trying to fish one and you're drifting the whole time, nobody's anchored. Yeah. So you're trying to drift through the spot and it's like if they're not biting, well, let's just like, let's let's go take a ride. Let's let's figure stuff out. And you, you know, George's everything's always pulling east, so you gotta be careful. Yeah. So you don't make it over the line. Yeah. Do you ever troll any out there? Um I have I put just like I would I just had one rod and I put a ballyhoo because yep. you'd see the half beaks and stuff around and you'd go to reset on your drift and you know sometimes you know because you're drifting and you just take it let's just keep going for a little while and next thing you know you're like seven miles away and you're way offshore so you try not to go fast and burn fuel like let's just throw a couple ballyhoos out yeah so we'd have a couple rods that would just just have a couple of swimming ballyhoos on them yeah we caught a few. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. What was kind of like your go-to spread at George's? Other, other obviously they had the the, the chumming circle. Madness, well, the chumming but, circle was great, and yeah. you, know, you, you know, it's funny. We did the exact same thing in Canada. Yeah, 2010, first years, first few years. Yeah, it was identical. Yeah. Well, like when yeah. you went there and it was quote unquote normal fishing, like a normal drift. Was it? What were you kind of doing? Um, you know, you, uh, there's a lot of mackerel, so you're fishing mackerels up high. Yeah. You might have a pollock or something else a ground fish a ground fish down deep some some sort <laughs> yeah. of animal that's swimming around down there george yeah. insert ground fish wherever those <laughs> in this by the way yeah um, doesn't matter yeah so you know that that you know just your typical spread like a, a a three bait spread is all that we were fishing i i you know i threw a kite up there a few times but generally everything was down a little bit mm -hmm. um and if they weren't down they were ripping it out of your hand on the side of the boat like constantly yeah. chumming um for the for for the first few years yeah. yeah but then everything got to be so expensive that you know the the fuel through the roof mm. the bait through the roof and it's like all right we'll just go out there and we'll go sabiki you know a tow to mackerels or something like that while we're out there and that's we did do that i mean just like what anybody else would do you know you sabiki up some bait and chopping stuff up and and just kind of uh going from there but a, a traditional spread would just be your standard far floater high yeah mid depth and then you're fishing your your ground fish or whatever down deep right um type of thing hmm. but i mean you just and we stopped chumming just because it, everything got to be so expensive the price of fish was coming down everything else was going up so your your margins were you know it's like oh you could try to get some stuff from the on the from the fish truck well it's you know 35 dollars a flat now i'm like right. it's 15 yeah. You know, fuel's now $3 and it was Sucks. 89 cents, you know, like, so that's part of the reinvention of yourself as to what you're doing. You know, like you, you got to go, go through and, and because I was a commercial bluefin guy for so long and I, you know, I started in the late nineties and, um, you know, I got to see the heyday of it. I mean, catching, you know, just blood baths of fish and, and, you know, we were averaging $10 a pound on our fish. Like, psh, that's great. You know, yeah. like that was the average. Yeah. 
and now you know to where things are at today you know you, you have to reinvent yourself now we're dealing with 455 dollars fuel and you know just like the cost of everything your dockage your insurance everything is so much higher that there's no there's nobody left out there that is just gonna go commercial bluefin tuna fishing yeah they're gone yeah they've either reinvented themselves or they're they're or just not there. or they're yeah exactly multi-fishery multi-commercial fishery but even the multi-commercial fishery, there's so much pressure from the state. And we got to know everything that's kind of going on. And not that like you're doing anything wrong. It's just like, then they start taking stuff away. The ground fish. Yeah. The Gear ground fish is gone. You know, like, you can't kill any cod anymore. You know, like, um, then they had a, the, the whole thing's kind of up and down. Yeah. It can be good or bad and, and, and stuff like now that. Now they're looking at mackerel. Yeah. Now we're only allowed what, two dozen mackerel or something. And yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. unless you have your federal multi-species though right then you can take whatever you want well which we all have yeah um so how many years was it bloodbath like 10 11 yeah and then it started so to we're wait. gonna go way back in the beginning for me like those guys used to have the quota filled the whole year's quota would be filled in like early August up in the Gulf of Maine. Like this is back in like the late eighties and early nineties. And then, you know, so it was like, by the time it got to us, you know, we weren't, it wasn't a big thing for me. And I was not shit. I was 15 years old. You know, it was nice to catch a few fish in the fall. You had your October quota and that's yeah. basically all that we lived off of. But, you know, I would now I'm like, say I'm 18 now. So that puts me at what? 90, 97, 98. Okay, and um, you know I'm running a, a single screw 35 Bruno, and you know I'm I'm running the boat like the guy let me go and and run the boat, so it's kind of like, man, that's you stop and think about it. like kids don't get to do that these days, like mm -hmm. running a 35 Bruno or whatever, and at 18 and just be like you know kind of go from there. He's like, look, here's the deal, go take the boat, go catch some fish. He's like, I know you're gonna catch some fish, but he's like, just stay in the bay. And it's like, okay, you know, like, whatever. I'm just happy to be on a boat, like, yeah. going fishing and some crap. And, you know, Independent. some days we get them, some days we don't. But, you know, that's how, you know, my, I started by tuna fishing in the bay. And then, you know, it's grown to, to be a much bigger operation now than it, than it used to be. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked. No, 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 you're good. All good. You're good. Uh, staying on track with the bay, you know, that's kind of your start. And now that's like... Correct me if I'm wrong, but like the last few years, it's been one of your bread and butter like fisheries. Yeah, especially sure. for giants, you know. Yeah, especially for giants. How's how have your tactics changed there? Um, how the tactics have changed? Well, the bait, yeah, has completely changed. Yeah. Um, let's talk about 2020. Let's yeah, talk about okay. COVID. All right, let's yeah. do that right now. In 2020, you guys were there. You guys were catching fish and all that stuff. It was epic. Mm -hmm. Well, that's flashback to March. In April of 2020, ground zero, hot spot is New York. Mm -hmm. They didn't touch any of those pogies. They let two million pounds of pogies go by. Two million pounds go by. I'm like, all right, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, let's saddle up. And that's when a buddy of mine that normally fishes Canada, he brings some of his groups. He's like, look, I'm in a spot. And I'm like, yeah, we can make this work. Like he had like 30 groups that needed to go that fall, and we didn't know how the business was going to be they were shutting us down open us up that we yep. didn't know how things were going to go but so back to 2020 there were so many fish and you guys can attest to this there were so many fish living in the bay the schools of pogies were just they were everywhere everywhere it was insane you could not you could not miss now i've had a bunch of like 60 fish years over over my career but that year i don't know how many i caught but it was definitely over 60 yeah and I bet you I caught 40 in the bay. And that's a big number for the bay. Like, shit, we used to be, like, we'd be pumped if we could catch, like, six or eight fish a year in the bay. Yeah. And now it's it was definitely over 40. We had one day where we we hooked a double, caught them both. I had to, I, we were allowed five a day. And I, I was up off of Gloucester, and we caught one, like, you know, 75-inch or something, and it was blowing its ass off. We came back and caught, hooked a double. Actually, it was before the double, we were catching bluefish on, on um, vertical jigs at like midnight, throwing them in the tank. I'm like, oh, yeah, put them out. We'll put them out in the morning type of thing. So we hook a double, catch both of those, and go back to the anchor. 
and you know processing the fish and all that stuff Psh, hook another one catch that one and then um so now we've got three in the bay from over the course of about four hours we had another one from uh up off of gloucester from the day before rod bends over again i'm like come on this can't really be happening and <laughs> ended, up being, ended up being thresher sharp it was like <laughs> oh my god you know but so you know it's like all of a sudden the hindsight just caught three in the bay you know and it was like literally 200 boats the next day so it's the boats you got to deal with the boats um you know and some guys you know there's a lot of boats that are out there that don't have Stressful. any any of the gear that they're required to have and we have to we all sit here and scratch our heads because look what happened in december this year i know 140 plus boats and and most of which don't have any of the yeah. proper gear and do what you do what you gotta do like i, I you know i i don't i don't get mad at it anymore or I try to give me get myself frustrated i've reinvented myself i have you know i i grew up my dad had a charter business um so i was around it as a young kid um i got into the whole tuna thing which kind of changed my life and then 18 years old boom i, I graduated high school i moved to florida and i still come back home every year i'd still come back and fish new england when we were when it was fun to do warm weather and all that stuff oh, yeah. but you know i was around the charter side of things all the time so fast forwarding again you know kind of touching back on george's bank type of thing like i was starting to take charters out there and you know i had to have certain insurance for it and all that stuff i'm like no nah, i'm just gonna pay it and everybody and these things these fish are still worth a lot at that time and people are like oh how can you be doing this you know why are you gonna put somebody on the rod that doesn't know how to do anything you know on a five thousand dollar fish i'm like dude i'm getting they're paying me like i mean yeah i've lost a few fish over the years because of you know people not knowing exactly what to do but just a few like right it's not as many, many as people think how many fish and, have i caught you know at the end of the day it's it's on you like you're the leader on the boat it's how right. well you train them instruct them this so, and the other thing yeah and you know you get into different things where you're you know, now we're using stand up and like you know we've got to do things differently and obviously you guys see we've got a chair we put in the boat yeah and you got i have as the driver i've got to fight things so much differently from a fish in the rod holder to a fish in the chair because it's not like you can just lay there yeah. and, and let the fish like pan you know pan out and you know i've got to stay I've got to stay, you know, staying clear of the fish. Yeah. Now the rod tip's basically at the corner of the boat versus... A little bit more jockeying. So a little bit more jockeying. And there's a little bit more jockeying when, you know, you're fighting these things on stand-up and, and doing it that way and, and keeping things square. And, you know, like I tell, you know, this this one guy I've got, um, fished a lot of days, he's caught 54 giants. with it's savage. He's caught, he's landed 54. I don't know how many have we lost, you know, another 50. There's guys that have been doing this for 10 years that haven't caught 54. That's insane. And a customer has and got a customer before. has got fish yeah. He fishes a lot of days, don't yeah. get me wrong. Yeah. But um, you know, it, you know, and this is over the, well, this is like a twelve year span now. Mm -hmm. like he missed a couple of years with COVID and all that stuff. But um he started fishing in two thousand and ten and that, that I brought him. He was a, one of the first guys that I brought to George's bank. I'm like, This is what it is, we're gonna go fish for a few days and and he's like, well, how's this going to go? I said, well, we're going to get there in the dark, and we're probably going to catch a couple in the dark, and maybe our last one by, by mid-morning, and we'll probably start working our way home. And that's exactly how it went. You know? <laughs> like, we caught two and lost one, and then got another one. Like, oh, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Like, sorry, it's taking so long. You know? <laughs> um, but, you know, so the reinventing of yourself. Like, you know, you can't, like kids these days and, and all this stuff, everybody's, you know, everybody's allowed to kill them and, or, or go and fish for them and doing all that stuff. So the more power to you, you know, it's, this is an open fishery, but just reinventing myself into the manner that, well, I, you know, I want to keep this, making this number right here. And so you, you've kind of want kind of more things. And I was ahead of the curve. Like this was in 2010. I was already taking tuna charters yeah. back then. Yeah. Like, so, and, and this is for commercial fish, not for, you know, for, you yeah. know, we're trying to sell these things, not just trying to take somebody to go um, catch a wreck fish in shore or something like that. So everybody, oh, why are you doing that? Well, I'm then they're like, hey, you know, this is, this is, and, and now they're all like, dude, you saw the writing on the wall. Yep. Mm -hmm. And now I've got this massive charter business um, and I'm very grateful for it. I don't take anything for granted. I'm, I'm super pumped that I've got that kind of business. I mean, I operate at a high level and I'm, I try to be as aggressive as I can be um, as far as catching the fish. And, but, you know, this is, this whole business got built, um, 
you know, by being a commercial fisherman for a long period of time, like, dude, if you don't, if you don't catch the fish, you ain't getting paid. Yeah. So figure it out. Yeah. Figure out how you're going to make this work. And then you just integrate it in. And I'm a people person. I don't mind talking to people. And I'll try to educate people, um, you know, as we're going through the through the phases of it. And then be like, hey, look, if, you know, this isn't Wicked Tuna. We're not going to yell and scream. If you want to be yelled and screamed at, you're going to have to pay extra. You know, like this is what <laughs> yeah. we would, we, yeah. you know, we would tell the people. But I'm just like, guys, we can go over a whole bunch of different scenarios of how this stuff is going to break down. But... Instead of doing all that, I said, I might tell you like seven different scenarios and it's the eighth one that happens. So we're not going to do it. We're going to shoot from the hip and I'm going to explain to you like, boom, these are the things that we need to get squared away. If we hook a fish, nobody's going to be yelling and screaming. Just help us get the other lines in. We're going to move the rod to the certain holder or if it's in the chair, we're going to go to the chair, you know, whatever the story may be. And, um, you know, you just kind of, you know, you just kind of morph yourself into that whole scenario and you just, you get those people to understand a little bit. And when people aren't, you're not yelling and screaming, people are just like so much more calm and cool and collected and, and all involving people is going to get them back. If so you're just but, sitting there doing everything you, for everyone you, you all the time. You can educate them on, on some of the stuff a little bit. And I'll, yeah. I'll tell them like, look, this is the, the, all right, this is the initial phase. We just hooked the fish. He's going to be doing some runs. He's going to go out. And then when we get to the point where he's going to go straight down, you know, now we're, now we're at a different phase and we're going to apply pressure a little bit differently. And we're going to, you know, and he, they're like, oh, my God, this is the best day of my life. You know, mm -hmm. thanks for the education on the whole thing. Um, as the, as you get to different stages of, of the fight of the fish and stuff like that. I mean, we're, we're known for catching them pretty quickly, but, dude, we run the drags up. Yeah, you have to. I feel like you lose we fish way pretty, less with higher drag. We fish pretty heavy drag. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you see some of my videos and the guys in the chair and the drag is locked. I yeah. mean, we are just at maxed out. We can't get it to go any higher. Yeah. yeah. It takes a lot of fish, though, to get confident with that. You know, and like George's probably Leaving doing in that. your little crimp that's a half inch long? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well. yeah. No, drag gets it done for sure. But yeah, the, the whole charter thing has been uh, really the only way to survive in this whole thing. For sure. You and know, as everything evolves and everything changes all the time, like the charter fishing is always going to be there. Now, you go back to 2010 and then you, we couldn't we couldn't charter fish like, oh, my God, like, what do I do? Well, I resorted back to being a commercial fisherman. We went and commercially fished for Haddock and we set this big thing up with Facebook and I remember had, all a, that. Yeah. had a great, great spring. And it's like now that a whole the whole body of fish that was coming there in the bay is gone. But I'm like, hey, you know what? Everything happens for a reason. And if there was ever a time for it to be in that spot and we're catching these haddocks so close, it was then. Mm -hmm. Like we couldn't charter fish and then the charters opened back up. And you have people that are nervous to come out and some people are like, screw it. We just want to go fishing. And then it was like and then if you guys remember, it got to August and they were putting like lock trying to lock down everybody yeah. in august and everybody's like at that point so like screw it i mean i had a fairly normal august um charter wise business wise it was one 2020 was one of our best years yeah. ever it was either you either you know depending on what business you were in not yeah. necessarily fishing but you know i know a lot of people that did really well and i know a lot of people that tanked and yeah. it, it wasn't good yeah um but you know, so the, the whole charter thing, you know, you can kind of flip flop back and forth. There was one instance where commercial fishing was a better situation to deal with over the charter because of COVID and because of the lockdown on all that stuff. Um, and, but that was just for a short period of time. It was a couple of months. And then you kind of try to get back into, yeah. your, into, your, into the swing of all the stuff that you're doing. So, you know, I'm again, we're, I'm fortunate. I've been able to, you know, I built this business up and I've got. I've got groups and all my groups, I've already made them, you know, give me dates for the groups that want three, four and five days yeah. at a shot. And I've already got like 40 something days in the Sick. books already. And it's January. Yeah. I can fill the other stuff in the one days and the two days are around all that stuff. But I got to make sure that the guys that are going to do the, the multi-day deals, they're already locked in. So, and that's how my business has kind of become. I moved the boat. I'm not in my home port. I go to Provincetown and it's like, you know, I'm a lot more, a lot closer. I mean, some days we go fish a mile out and we're hanging them right there. You have a lot of customers that fish with you or have fished with you in the past in Florida and up here? Yeah. 
Yeah. Like that guy that caught 54 with me, I met him taking him sword fishing in Florida. I caught him his first sword. That's sick. And he's caught a few more swords with me since then. And, and, you know, he just, I told him, I was like, oh, I'm from Massachusetts. And, you know, this is before I owned the business. I was just running somebody, you know, somebody else's boat. And this is what I do during the summertime. He's like, I'm, you know, I think I want to come up there and do that. And I'm like, oh, okay, here's my number. And, you know, the guy calls. Yeah. And it's like, he's like, hey, you remember me? I'm like, yeah, I know exactly who you are. And, and that whole relationship has morphed in it. But some of these groups that I'm fishing multiple days, three, four, five, six day trips, I would say majority of them came from Florida. It's awesome. Well, what percentage of off the street customers do you have versus experienced anglers? Well, it's it's charter fishing, and you might have a, a group that is experienced, but they bringing novices with them yeah. type of situation. But my business as a whole, like I don't know how exactly how to tackle that question, but my business as a whole is I'm ninety five percent repeat or referral. Yeah. I don't have much like new, like, oh, I just got your number off the internet or something. Generally, something will come from, hey, you know, I fish with so-and-so. You know, and we know a lot of people, you know, with with all of us being part of Penn and Pure Fishing and all that stuff, like, your your doors are open. There's not yep. that many of us that have the the sponsorships like that that we all have yeah um so you know it's like oh so and so and you know i might not talk to that guy in two years but he's like oh he was talking about wanting to go bluefin tuna fishing here and call this guy this is his instagram page or whatever it is or and people reach out through me from there but what's your approach on customers that also have their own boats and are fishing with you to learn you know you still got to be able to do it. And, yeah. and I have, uh, there, there's some guys that have their own charter businesses now and they're doing pretty good. Um, I'm not going to mention anybody, but they would charter me some and just, you know, trying to get a, probably a little traction to just to kind of see where they're at. Um, and, you know, they become, they become pretty successful, but I don't really worry about too much. Like I won't give the customers like super fine details of like the little the little tricks that we all know yeah like i don't you know i'm not rigging stick baits in front of people for them to understand that stick baits pretty simple yeah operation and, right. and people know about it and, and stuff like that but just like these little idiosyncrasies to try and get that bite or moving stuff around or if you're drifting or you know you you know, you're up and down and currents picked up when you get tired you know situation. looking at your angles and, yeah. and and stuff like that i don't i won't say that stuff to them and they'll go and catch a few fish but you know i mean yeah. hey you're gonna pay me to take you fishing i'm, I'm gonna take you fishing yeah likewise you know? I, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna worry about you know i mean to this day and all the years that i've had um under my belt as far as the fishing goes like i don't have any people that were customers of mine that are going and outdoing me or or really even being part of a the grand scheme of things type yeah. of thing. I mean, you can't make a living as a, no. as a, uh, oh, what's up? <laughs> We've definitely had some customers that are really consistent now. Yeah. yeah. Catch, catching fish, you know, on their own, mm -hmm. especially like commercial fish going out high fleet, big fleet days and pulling a fish out of it. It's pretty impressive. We have a few like, you know, like New Hampshire, Main, main guys, guys that yep. come down and fish with us and they apply what they see up there and yep. do pretty good and yeah guys in new york and rhode island and yeah. but it's cool to see well what you guys are majority of what you guys are doing and i mean i'm doing it too but i'm just saying what you guys are doing because you guys are a little further north than i'm at so i'm i'm fishing generally a little bit and we, we cross paths obviously yeah. and we see each other but you know what you guys are doing with the anchoring up and 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 all that stuff well that's how they fish up there yeah everybody's anchored yep. nobody's drifting Yep. And, you know, so you have, they're coming down, they're seeing what you guys are, you guys are heavy production, you guys are catching a lot of fish, whether you're killing them or letting them go. Now most, we're let, we let go way more than way more. we kill now, yeah. um, which is fine. Yeah. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But those guys are coming down to charter you because they're applying that to the same thing, how they're fishing up there, fishing on the on the edges and, and learning the, learning the areas. Knolls. But they still got to go up there and do it themselves. Right. You know, yeah. they got to go get on the spots and, and learn how to deal with the tides and deal with boats. And, you know, not having 600 feet of scope out. So when the tide changes, you've got your fenders out because the guy next to you is only fishing 300 feet of rope. You exactly. know what I mean? There's, there's a lot of like little... Little Nuances. things that, that kind of go on with all that. That's what we should do. Have a rope distance standard on <laughs> yeah. the bank. Yeah. yeah. That'd be Regulation. awesome. You got the guys that have 208 feet and the guys that have 700 feet. 
Yeah. I think the the, the trolling motor thing. I, I watched you guys when you caught that when we were, when I came up there and fished next to you guys. I'm like, that, that's a pretty slick trick right there. Like, to Get be stick. able to hold yourself. We don't use it all the time, but when it's calm or wind against tide, when you can, whatever, it's caught us some fish. I'd say sure. you, this year I can think of probably five or six days that you got a bite and we didn't because we had to set up for the switch. Yeah. Like, we'd show up and be like, okay, the, the tide's going to change in like an hour. Do we want, is the fish, are they going to bite right before the slack? Or are they going to bite after the slack? Which side should we set up for? You know, we got to swing up to where they're going to bite. Yeah. I and stop we, even thinking about that stuff. It's anymore. hard. It's like, I'm just going to rip the anchor up and reset. You know, yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's, well, you my have mind. a hauler. We don't have a hauler. Well, I don't really, belt. I don't, but they don't use the hauler oh, that, no. that much either. Like that hauler, it, it, it'll get it up. But you know, like, you know, if we're, if, like, I won't even, I'll just pull my tether in and, and put the loop on the yeah. cleat. And I'll just do a circle and just kind of get back. Okay, well, the tide's doing this, wind's doing that, and kind of get to that angle where I want to be. But I don't even bring the anchor in. Yeah. I'll just, just pull it. I'll just, it'll pop out of the bottom and you're floating it up. And then, you know, obviously, if you get 300 feet out there, just go go beyond it a little bit. Give yourself 450 feet, you know, yeah. and then Let you it know, slide fall, back fall back or do whatever you need to do. I mean, yeah. it's not trying to be lazy, but it's trying to do it quickly. Save your back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know. What's sick about the Rodan too is like fallen tide. Say you want to fish like the top of the step or incoming tide, bottom, whatever. You can shift with fucking three rods still out. Yeah. yeah. You know? It's tough too with the herring because like, you know, if you know they're going to realistically only bite a herring that morning and you catch two herring. Yeah. And you have one or two of them on the hook and you know you need to change. Yeah. You know, now you're yeah. like... Uh, and but yeah, he doesn't have to bring his gear in. No, so I know, but I'm saying like yeah. if you're if you're too deep or you're too shallow or whatever, and then you're thinking about all right, I got to reposition, I got to reel your shit in, mm -hmm. can be daunting, you know, because you feel like you're gonna reel them in, get rid of the baits that you think you're really gonna get bit on, reset and put baits out that you know. And yeah. we re we rehook herring and stuff all the time, but I'm just saying like, yeah, you gotta move quick if you're gonna, gonna move, move around. You know, like, you get a, you get a little bit of time, but yeah. I mean, I'm not running chillers or anything like that to help keep keep the herring alive during the summertime. I mean, just ma mackerel are so abundant, yeah. you know. Pretty pretty hardy. Um, chartering clients, Charter. circling back and us getting us back squared away here. Um, let's get into like some story time. A little bit mm. share some lessons learned and some experiences and stuff i mean we've kind of talked about morphing into chartering and staying alive through that and building a big business and who we have who you have for clients and how the fisheries change how the baits change but like what's some crazy shit you've seen like what's the scare like some of the scariest moments you've so <sighs> this episode of the podcast is brought to you by the dion children foundation the Dion Children Foundation was established by the Dion family as a way to bring awareness to rare and ultra-rare genetic diseases in children, such as limb girdle muscular dystrophy, or LGMD. LGMD is a neuromuscular disease that causes progressive muscle weakness, leading to the loss of ambulation, and eventually affects the heart and lungs. Recently, the Dion family was faced with the heartbreaking news that their son Peter and daughter Maggie were diagnosed with LGMD and are battling this rare disease. The core belief at the Dion Children Foundation is that no child should be left behind. For more information or to donate to this incredible cause and family, please visit the Dionfund.org. I'll, I'll start with this one here because this is a one that it's a story that kind of gets talked about a little bit more than anything else. I was, um, I had the, H and H. So this is back in like 02, 03, something like that. And I'm fishing up in Maine. We we're just living on the boat all summer long. And like we had cell phones back then, but we didn't have I didn't have a sat phone on the boat. I was just a poor guy trying to, you know, put my stuff together. But we did have one of those analog bag phones, you mm -hmm. know, and they, you had a little booster on it. So sometimes, you know, you get calls or something that would come through, you'd be 30, 40 miles out, blah, 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 blah. So call comes through, it's my mate, it's his girlfriend. Long story short, there's an issue, and he's like, I got to get in. I'm like, bro, we don't have any fish on the boat. We are 40 miles out. What has transpired 
isn't going to make a difference whether you get in tonight or in the next couple of days. And he's like, you know, he's mad, but he's like, okay, I get it. He's like, you don't want to go 80 miles, 40, 40 each way just to get rid of me, you know, type of thing. So flash forward two days later, we've lost like three, four fish. Like it, it just like everything that's kind of going wrong is kind of going wrong. And this kid is just, he's losing his mind. He's, he's lost his mind. Like he can't even, I don't even, it just got to the point where we didn't even talk. So there's another boat that was there and he caught his fish. He's like, I'm headed in. And he's like, please, he's begging me, please let me get on that boat. I need to get home, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, you know what? Screw it. Get on the boat. So now I'm out there by myself in a 40 footer tuna fishing. It ain't, it ain't, it was something that at the time, because I didn't have any bad experiences with it. I'm like, yeah, screw it, whatever. I can do it. I'm a kid. I'm bulletproof, you know, type of thing. And um, anyway, long story short, when those, sum those summer storms come through and I'm anchored up, and there's a there's a couple, there's only a couple of us that are even there, you know. Um, the storm comes through, and it was it blew me off the edge. The the way that the the wind was pulling everything, you know, we we're anchored up like steep on the edge. So obviously, you're gonna get it's getting pulled. It's just gonna rip the anchor out of the bottom. So now I'm adrift and I get a monk net caught in my anchor. Now, this is the old boat where I don't have the hauler and all that stuff. So I gotta, gotta try to get this thing up by, by hand. Um, so I'm trying to pull it up and you know, it's, it's a nightmare. It's like 10 foot, it's raining, it's, it's terrible conditions and I'm by myself. And I'm trying to like, I had controls in the back of the boat and I get it up and I just I get to the point where you just, you're ripping it up and then you, you know, you back up real hard together, like 50, 60 feet of line. And then, you know, you keep doing the whole process. Well, got to the process where now I'm at the chain and I got the chain wrapped around the cleat and nobody ever, none of us ever like a chain wrapped around a cleat, you know, yeah. it just doesn't feel safe. It doesn't seem that way. So anyhow, like it's still, and keep in mind, it's blowing like 30, 35, maybe gusting higher than that. It's, it's, it's super crappy. And the anchor is just hovering over the back of the boat and it's got the, the net is just pulled up. Sorry, dude. I don't know whose net it was, but your <laughs> net was screwed. <laughs> so, you know, the anchor is literally just hovering out of the water and there's so much tension on it because I've got the entire net that I'm dragging with me. Yeah. And I'm, I'm trying to get, you know, inch it up. I didn't have a spare anchor or, you know, I didn't at the time we weren't thinking about like cutting my anchor off and just letting shit go. You know, mm -hmm. you just didn't think that way. So I reached out and I've got the boat, I'm backing the boat up and, it, you know, getting the momentum going, going backwards. And I, I try to, you know, I've got a knife in my hand and I'm trying to like reach out and just cut the, um, cut the, the, the net a little bit, little by slow. I rolled off the back of the boat. I was so stretched out and just got a sideways wave or whatever it was, a little rogue, rogue wave. And I, and I'm looking at the net. And the anchor is like literally like 10 feet away from it. Not even, not even. It's like five feet off the back of the boat because I'm sitting there trying to cut the net. And I got one arm over the rail and, I, you know, th that held me on. And I'm looking back, my, my feet are dangling in the water, the motors, you know, everything's just sitting right there. And I'm just looking at this net just like it's about to engulf me. And unfortunately, I, I pulled myself, I got back in the boat and I just sat in the corner for like 20 minutes. I didn't move. I'm like, man. That's the closest I've ever come. I'd been dead, dead instantly. No shit. Like the net would have just engulfed me and, you know, that would have been, that would have been it. Oh my God. So it was like, okay. Like there was like, that was a big deal. That was, you know, and eventually, you know, I got my wits back about me and I was able to cut the thing free and, and long story short, I got, I got back on the anchor and just told the guy the one guy that was there he's like you're fucking foolish to be out here i'm like dude you're out here by yourself you know yeah. like it was just one of those things that that it kind of transpires the system for i vowed sure. to never do it again yeah from that day on from 2002 or whatever to not fish alone ever again yeah and there was one time that i ended up fishing alone just a freak situation um and i caught a fish and i'm like well Hey, and I was on, you know, anyway, long story short, I caught, I caught the fish and I'm like, well, if it's, if it's my time to go, then it's my time to go. And it's like, it'd be a hell of a way to go really. You yeah. Know, whatever. Yeah. If I got to go out this way, then, then so be it. Um, yeah, I don't think, I think that's a that's great story for people to hear. Cause there's a lot of there's solo, a lot of, solo, like, all pop, no, you know, if you want to do it, do it. But 
It's fucking, I wouldn't do it. I've never done it. I've never done a no. solo tuna. Never. I don't suggest it. Yeah. Highly suggest you always, I mean, it, it's not, I mean, you, you think back at a time in our life when, you know, I was a commercial fisherman and the highs and the lows and the money that would roll in and then the money that wasn't there. And, and you know, it, and there's no consistency about it. And that's why charter fishing, the consistency is there. Mm-hmm. You've reinvented yourself now. Now I can, I went from a commercial tuna fishing uh, guy that did a few charters on the side to then we started integrating the tunas in with the charters. And now what we're all doing. Yeah. is just charters so and then we get you know we sell we're selling a few fish on and, and, and kind of going from there but all these people think that you know these fish are worth 10 bucks 15 bucks 20 bucks a pound and that's the hardest part for me as far as like the charters if i bring on somebody new somebody calls me hey you know we've never done this before so and then like i go into like a 30 minute conversation I'm like look this isn't wicked tuna you know that show definitely crushed our fishery it did um so be it, you know, reinvent yourself. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't sit on around the side and be woe is me and be kicking the tire. Go and reinvent yourself, figure out how to make, make it work, which you guys have done with your boats and all that stuff. And like the charter fishing is that's just the way it, it's got to go. Now you can still make the money. You got to work a little harder. You got to deal with people. And that I get, I think that's nice part about my business is the fact that, um, you know, I've been doing this for so long and I've called so many people out that I don't want. And there is a list in my phone and they are not nice names that are in my phone. Like if these people were to call and like straight to voicemail yeah. or, you know, I'm always cordial to people and professional. I'm like, hey, man, I'm booked. You know, I can't I, yeah. I can't do it. And so you get rid of some of that those people. And, you know, I'm sure you've had some pain in the asses on the boat before. Oh, yeah. And, mm-hmm. you know, you're able to call you know the more the more years you guys got invested in this whole thing you can refine your client list exactly and that's that's how i've gotten to be where i'm at like people that don't want to tip dude you got to tip you know yeah. like i'm not it's it's customary and you know but you know you have arguments with with not necessary arguments you have discussions with people about it and then if they don't correct it then they can move on like mm-hmm. i'm not trying to pat myself or got my nose up in the air but we're all here to make money being a fisherman just in general is not an easy thing to do, as mm-hmm. we know. Yep. We're getting beat up. You know, there's obviously all sorts of stuff that's constantly going on with the boats, maintenance wise, you know, no fishing sleep. wise, weather wise. Dude, I got struck by lightning yeah, this year. I was just going to say, speaking of which, <laughs> let's talk <laughs> tell, about your tell, adventure. Tell us about the lightning story. So, the lightning story, I wasn't even on the boat. I had taken the day off. <laughs> I had my feet up on the couch, and my wife's like, What are you doing? Like, because I'm, I'm never at home. I'm, I'm always gone. I'm like, I exit out. I'm just eating strawberries, <laughs> you know? And there was a squall that had come through. And um, so the boat was tied to the dock. And I was like, I guess that's. That's an omen. Like I got, I got to fish every single day, you know, type of thing. But yeah. um, it's my worst nightmare. I don't wish it on even my worst enemy as to what I went through this summer. I kept the boat running. I didn't lose any trips. But I mean, I was piecing stuff together. I was. It was like you had a snorkel and mask as a fish finder. <laughs> <laughs> four four hours in the morning in the dark before i would go fishing now we weren't tuna fishing we were just bass fishing or fishing in shore close yeah um i had enough spare electronics to you know i didn't have a bottom machine didn't have a radar um but i had a potter and i could get close in some of the spots or or whatever or if it was the tide was low and the sun was bright i could see see my spots that i wanted to hit for bottom fish and stuff like that but um it was a total nightmare total nightmare and you know I, you know, then thank God for insurance, which was great. But I think it was the taxing side of things like, okay, I'm going to go work on the boat for four hours. I'm going to go run two trips for 12 hours. And then I got a couple more hours of continuing to start piecing things back together Mm. um, at the end of the day. And I did that for like 10 days straight. And like, I was red labeling was July, August time too. That was like in July. Heat perfect, like so time. perfect timing. I mean, uh, it yeah. was, it was like I'm booked every single day, blah blah blah. You know, doubles every day. You know, type of situation. And so that was, it was a nightmare. There was a lot, you know, and you know, I'm not. I can keep my boat running for the most part and and all that stuff. But boy, did I learn some. I learned some stuff from that whole ordeal, and that took a that took a while. It was like probably at least three weeks straight. 
and I had to shell it all out. Like the insurance helped me out and I got it back. But in order to keep the business going, I spent like $40,000 right out of the gate. What'd, just you, what'd you have to replace? All the electronics, um, anything, anything on the bridge. So all the electronics on the bridge, radios, it hit the VHF antenna. And, it, and of course it hits the brand new radio, blew the radio like right out of the, <laughs> Jesus um, right out of the console. And, um, you know, never touched the 110 side. So the 110 side, I still had, you know, all the stuff was working. It was just 12 volt side that it wiped out. But yeah. I mean, every pump, sea chest, live well, you know, bay, uh, bilge pumps, toilet pumps, toilet motor, um, all the lights, all the derb rights got wiped out. All the, you know, my track vision, everything was completely smoked. But my, I have a mechanical engine, so the boat fired up. So I was able to kind of keep going and yeah. just grabbing stuff from home just to like piece it together to get it to get it to work. And it was it was it was painful. Like it put so much stress in my life. I think that's probably why I pinched a nerve in my back because oh, I've been shit. carrying that around all summer long. Well that you're six foot five replacing bilge pumps and <laughs> hanging up hanging upside down. But I mean, just like some of the stuff that, you know, I just never had to like really worry about. You know, and now I got to do it. Like, there's, it's, it's July. You're gonna get somebody. I remember when, a few of those phone when, calls. When yeah. are you gonna, when are you gonna get here? Like, no, that's not gonna work. I can be there next week. No, I gotta figure it out now. Like, I, and I would go and figure it out. And there's definitely a few phone calls, a couple of YouTube videos. Like, <laughs> okay, and it was like all of a sudden you learn to get it and you understand it. So it, it made a, I think it made me a little, little better person, like mechanically wise. Everything happens for a reason. If it, even I don't know about that sucks. reason, bro. That was bad. <laughs> that was bad. Oh, that's helpful for people to hear. I've heard, let's see, Scotty at the dock. Didn't the Lavelles get struck one year? He got struck. He's fishing in PEI, Nova sticks. Scotia. Yeah, but the, the stick yeah. never got hit. Oh, really? No, never touched the stick. The stick's just fiberglass. Oh, yeah. That's true. Still got the antenna where it was blown in half and hanging, you know, Um but yeah, I mean, there's just so much and just just like up and down. And fortunately, the boat's fairly easy to work on as far as raceways going up to the top. And I didn't have to replace a whole lot of wiring itself so much as the units themselves. Yeah. yeah. But some of like the network cables and, and all that stuff for the electronics and stuff, they were all wiped out. You know, I just had to had to start fresh. But yeah, it's brutal. Have you used the green stick much? I used it this year for the first time in like five years. Did you? Yeah. Any action? Yeah, we caught a few yellow fins on it. Cool. We, went, we went down there south of the dump and in nice. the shipping lanes. And then, you know, it was, uh, I had these guys for six straight days. And we want to go to the canyon. We want to do all that stuff. And, like, everybody's, like, you know, trying to get a second mate because uh, the second mate's so much, do that with one mate. So, so much easier. And my mate's 18 years old. Like, he's got no clue. So yeah. I'm just trying to do it all. And we went down there. Um, we caught some yellow fins and we worked our way back up. And that's when we fished down off of Nomans and all that stuff. And all those fish, all the blue fins were in there. And, yeah. like, we just converted straight back to bluefin fishing and we whaled on them i mean i don't know we caught like 20 fish in like four days or something and and um we killed uh we killed a giant and then we let me let another one go and um we just kept wreck fish for that's sick and those guys i'm like i don't know they still got to be eating tuna i mean they took a they took a wreck <laughs> fish home they took five wreck fish home jesus because uh, we killed a giant one day yeah and we caught tunas every day and they took five home with them and and i think we killed killed a small thresher and they're like oh we don't want that and oh i'm like oh God, and i'm like yeah yeah you don't want that and i'm like <laughs> dude i said dude you got to take a little bit of this shit home i was like it, it's so good it's like swordfish and he's it, like really and i'm like i said just take a little bit you know <laughs> And it was a nice, it was a smaller one too. So it was like not like trying to kill one of those, those like great buck big 50s, giant ones. 100 pounders, buck 50s are unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. You don't catch many of those up here though. No. Dude, December like 3rd, I caught pounds. one this year. Yeah, a little one. Yeah, I caught one like 100 pound. 100 no pounder. way, really? I, the only ones I've ever caught on the bank or stone ledge, whatever, fucking like 300 plus pounds. Right. Every single one of them. They're huge. Huge. Um, I'm like, guys, you want to kill this thing? You know, they're, they're really good eating. And I'm like, if it's a slow day of tuna fish and whatever, and it's like, oh, it's a big sea creature. I'm like, you know, we're doing this for a reason. We're not just killing it to kill it. Like, they're really good to eat. But I don't know as I'd really want to eat a 300-pounder. But yeah, 
like he we're, we're cutting them down and like they couldn't leave them with their coolers they can't even pick up their coolers <laughs> that, like the the plug is so big on the thing but i mean everybody that oh, I've, I've, we've killed one for and they're like yeah man that that fish was awesome that was so good but yeah like that was like december it was snowing that day it mm. was like the the third or the fourth of december whatever it was this year and we we uh we had, I think we we caught a we had caught a fish or something. No, we hadn't caught one. It was the day before we caught. So it was the fourth. It was I think it was the fourth. It was when caught. it slowed down. Looked amazing in the morning. You had one rip it out of your hand, missed it, and then you got a thresher, right? Yeah, something. Is that like how it went? I think that's it. We all pulled in. It was like sheer waters. Mike marked a couple while he was macro fishing. We thought it was going to happen, and it just like never happened. Well, the bait was just top to bottom. You know, there's a there's a, a fine line there because obviously we want to we want to fish and we want to catch some fish. And December is really the only time that we're going to get paid for our tunas. Yeah. And so it's just like, you know, that Saturday with 140, 150 boats, that's what killed it. Yep. And we all we, we all know that. Oh yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's like. It was starting to fade, and the weather was atrocious. And I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to speak for you guys, but I'll speak. I'll speak for myself. I was, I was kind of ready for it to be done. You know, it's like how it stayed open. I mean, they went over. We don't know how far they went over. I don't think that anything's even been posted yet. When was your last charter? So, did you have any break between charters in December? Did you go all the way to November. Yeah, I, I I had charters in November. Yeah, and we were, you know, we I did one charter, you know, and it's like trying to fit some of these people in. I mean, obviously there was a bunch of fish around, and you know, November is like the new October. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of fish. Um, so it, it's like trying to like my hunting trips. I'd be gone. November is like we we're all gonna do do some of these things, but I travel around a little bit, and then I'd be home, and then trying to get it orchestrated with with trying to get charters in, and we did have we had. Uh, had five bites we hooked five by Sick. like 11 o'clock in the morning one time one one day and we we caught we caught four and then we just you know and this was like november it was right after thanksgiving yeah. i think yep that's awesome so you know we have all that but i didn't I, I i i maybe i get to the point where i'll take charters in december but you know we're gonna go fishing no matter what well for the most part no matter what and I don't, you know, some of it's not safe to be taking no. clients out. Most of those days are gross. Cold. Yeah, we kind of call it Halloween just because weather and can end up in the red real fucking fast if you get weathered out. And then we don't, I mean, we have some clients that can tolerate that sort, those sort of conditions, but you definitely have more. Well, for the big boat, yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the guys that are out there in these center consoles, I mean, more power to them. Like, yeah. I don't know if it's stupidity or I was if it's winter, just... I was winterized before November. I yeah. No, but I mean, it's like, how you know, how bad do you need it? And it's like, you know, part of the part of the problem with... And this is probably going to raise a few hairs when I say this, but, you know, this, this fishery has become more of an Instagram game and flexing my muscles and people just want to post stuff and they don't care that they're going to get a dollar a pound for their yeah. tuna. Mm -hmm. And because of that mentality and the way that a lot of people are thinking... I mean, it drives the price down all the way around, but that's why there's no tuna, commercial tuna guys surviving that way because if it's open, I'm going, Yeah, you know, and whatever. It's open, go do what you want to do. The, the thing is, is it, it's enough money to break even on your hobby. On your hobby, yeah, that, but what about know, the guys that do that, this for I know, a living? I know, but, you know that's, like, but that's what drives that whole Insta-fame shit. Yeah. Well, you know? whatever. It is what it is. That's how the world turns, you know. And you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm. I somehow I got old, but you know, it was. It's one of those things that you just have to adapt and adjust and look and wonder what in another fifteen or twenty years what things are going to be like. I know. Because I've got probably another twenty years in me of doing this at a at a at a reasonable high level. Dude, you what do you think that? it's going to be like? I have no idea. It's like what you what, what I, you have thought where things would be today? Like, yeah. it's an open fishery. You know, there's you know you have all this. You know, we'd go to you know a limited entry and stuff like that, or control dates, and, and you know all these words just kind of get thrown along. But nothing ever seems to really transpire. The amount of boats that are out fishing is insane. Mm, it is insane. I mean, COVID sparked that though. Everyone can oh, work from their boat. COVID sparked the TV show and everybody. TV show. You know, they can work. Every, like half. I feel like half of the fleet can work while they're tuna fishing. 
Right. You know? Yeah. Oh, the thing, hang on. You can keep that fish on there. I got to <laughs> yeah. send this email real quick. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, you know, the, the TV show crushed it, and, and that, that killed a lot of a lot of stuff for us. The thing, the biggest thing that I get a kick out of, and, you know, I just happen to have an ad out right now because I'm, gonna, I'm getting rid of an ST, you know, but the amount of tuna tackle that gets recirculated every spring and fall. It's crazy. Like, oh, only been used one year. Like, yeah, we can understand yeah, Got that. into it, got out of it. Got into it. Uh, I caught seven fish and got paid, like, $3,000, and, you know, yeah. and my fuel bill is 10 you know, like, you it's, know. It's so. Funny, like the the wicked the wicked tuna thing for sure is a double edged sword because I think it's definitely increased like the awareness of giant bluefin around here, and I think it's honestly increased our charter business because yeah, of I it. Yeah, I would say it yeah, probably but has, it's it, it also has, but like that's what you've had to the, adapt to, right? The the money part of it obviously it sucks. Yeah, but the charter business. killing and selling a fish and and all that. You know, it was, I can't, I don't really remember when the, the, the transition was really starting to happen when we would go from killing every, every one to like, uh, you know, it was a tough time for me in the, in the beginning stages of it when we were, we needed to let them go. We couldn't kill them. It's illegal yeah. to, you know, mm-hmm. openings, closures, you know, um, buyer closures. Yeah. Whatever that, the, whatever that may have been at the time. And it's like, you're, you're letting them go. And now it's just normal. Everything's yeah. just normal now. This is the this is the new way, and like we run the drags up quick. And I, honestly, we don't try to if we if we're letting them go. Like I'll run the drags up fast and hard, and we're not fighting these things for more than I try to keep it under twenty minutes. Yeah, we're the same. Occasionally, you get one that's like, yeah, you get an ass yeah. fish that you know just. It's, it's just you every everything you're doing you know. But th- those are the ones that like you, you kind of want to stay away from the bay from. Because you don't want to hook a 900 pounder. You're not going to get a 900 pounder of the boat in 20 minutes. Yeah. You know, those 100, 105 inches, yeah, you can, you know, just put the put the coals to them and, and get them up. And you know, we break a few off, but not not as many as you would think by running it up like that. Yeah. What's your biggest one? 1,200. Wow. It's a fucking hammer. Locally or offshore? No, it was on George's. Oh, yeah. And that, that poor fish, that, I mean... And I was way, and I don't think I've ever caught one in this spot since. Like I was way down the bank. I was like 15 miles down the bank, but there was nothing biting on the on the edge, and it's all like 70 to 150 feet deep. And in the, you get you get you get like six seven miles down the bank, and it, it it gets deeper again. And you'll see the I don't know how much time you guys have spent out there, but none. For We've me. never been there. So you know you get like seven eight miles down the bank, something like that. I don't know exactly, but I could look at a chart and be able. to figured out pretty quickly but the the lobster guys are set in, in some of these deeper as it as it got deeper again and you know the fish were there it's just like oh my god this place is so big yeah. and, and you know like we're we're, we're a pin pin yeah. in this whole thing yeah so that fish man that was a, that was a crazy trip we were allowed four um at this stage of the game and we had caught this that was the that was, I think that was the the twelve hundred pounder was the third fish that we had caught out of the four that we we were able to take before we had to go home, and I already had like a seven hundred dresser in the boat. Jesus. And then we caught a couple like five fifties something like that, but that fish that tuna was so big that I, you know we had them on a block and tackle and I mean. The belly was getting pushed in. My door is huge on a ramp. I was gonna say. It's huge. I was gonna say. And like, it's like it took everything we had. There's just two of us on the boat and block and tackle from the wall, and we just had to like, you know. And we're trying. I didn't have a hauler at the time, so I couldn't even get back to it and wrap yeah. and, and suck it up with the hauler. You know, it was just pulling it through the door. But that tuna ate, and. It was just, you knew it was a big one because those big ones, they just kind of cruise. Yeah. They're just going to, you know, no matter where your drag's at, he's not going to be hauling ass doing 30, 40 miles an hour. He's just doing like 15 miles an hour and just going and going and going. So we're zipping up, you know, trying to get the other stuff in. He's way out there at this point, but we're drifting. We don't have to worry about an anchor or anything like that. Long story short, when they get out there like that, they'll get tail wrapped. We caught him in like 15 minutes. Yeah. And mate, and my mate's bringing it up, and we were able to determine, like, oh, he's he's tail wrapped. But as as we all know, it's hard to harpoon a tail wrapped fish. Very, yeah. Because you're, it's against the grain. You need got. So I'm over here. He literally reeled that thing up so the tail was like, you know, a foot and a half from the rod tip, 
and I'm like, I get to the side and I, and I just jab him. I get, you know, I'm, I'm leaning way out and I, I stick him and he kind of flinches, but didn't do anything. I'm like, get a rope, you know? And we put him on the, on the cleat, man. And he about tore the freaking boat I'm apart. Sure. And we got to do We got ended up getting two ropes on him and I ran it to a different cleat. Like I was just, you know, nothing happened to the cleats or, you know, but the, he was just, the whole boat was just sitting there shaking. I'm like, man, so that's a pretty big one. We didn't know how big it was at the time, but it was a cartoon character. I think with the tail off, it was like, it was over 900 with the tail off. That's fucking crazy. That's, that's a hammer. I always try to aim for the asshole when they're tail wrapped. It's like my go-to yeah, thing. Yeah, but it's just like you get that. It, it depends on which way it comes at you. you but just, like you my just, first thing that goes to my head is like, just stick them in the fucking asshole. Yeah. Cause you got all those like tendons and that like flap on that bottom sickle and you got a target stuff. too yeah and you got a target they always come exactly. up with the belly right at you too so you're like yeah worried about where to harpoon them it's always the horrible luck of the well, belly like staring a, at you you got like a foot in front of that bottom sickle to all the way to the tail where you're in, you're not going to really mess much up yeah. you know not that it matters well you anyway. just you're just trying to get it done yeah because you know especially you know if you tail rep fish is going to come up really quick but they're 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 disoriented, but they still got energy if they're if they can figure something out. Yeah, yeah. And so you gotta you gotta move pretty quickly on that. Here's a question we uh, just to jump around a little bit. Question we've asked, I think every charter captain we've had on the podcast. If you could try, it's one of my things, dog. You ask. Oh, all right. If you could try one tactic that you've always wanted to do up here to catch bluefin that you know you you can't do because you're either chartering or you're like you have to catch a fish or whatever just something that you've wanted done wanted to do for what, what would you say 10 days two yeah, weeks like you could spend a, like a week yeah a, a week, week straight weeks. trying something you've never tried but you've always wanted to try right. it like oh i wish i could do this but like you're doing something that you feel more comfortable comfortable with because as far as the tuna the game boat. yeah like a tactic maybe you do in florida Man, or there, you do there's wherever. nothing i hold back on Okay. I mean, I just, you know, from hand feeding them to, to doing, I won't, I won't, you know, even if it's a group that's on the boat that, that might have their own boat and going to do stuff. Yep. Um, because if you're, if you're trying to do something different or, you know, to try and see if it's going to work, well, fishing's tough at that stage of the game anyway. So, I, I, you know, it's like if you have somebody on the boat that doesn't really know what's going on or they're trying to learn how to do it. It's more so about that specific situation that's happening at that time yeah. where, you know, if you're trying to do something and I, I, I don't know that how to redefine the question. Like, are we talking about like if fishing's really good or if no, it's like, like say you're, you're really comfortable live bait fishing or you're really comfortable trolling. Hey, hey you can catch one on the squid and the kite, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So is this something that you've always thought of, like in the back of your head, you know, I, I really want to try, like we were talking about, is there a way to rig, you know, dead pogies and troll pogies in the bay or like like weird stuff like that is there, is there something that you've like, always like wanted fad to try fad dredges like putting fad dredges fad, out in no. the canyons like anything weird anything that you've like been like eh as far as the bluefin game no not really i mean i just don't you know so he's like can... sandro basically sandro's yeah. like no i don't want to change <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah <laughs> no i mean yeah. you know and it's like you know you you're only gonna your window to try something different and, and see if we can make it work like like i told you guys about the whole squid thing and the yeah. kite you know like no reason try no i didn't even know anybody that ever tried it like yeah we've caught some tunas on squids before and it is my literally my favorite bait to use now but at the time like you know, that would be something that, that, you know, that's, that's give it a shot because we don't have bait and, and we're in an area where there's a lot of smaller fish. I've got a charter on the boat. Like we can put a blue fish out, but we can't kill a big one or, um, you know, so you just kind of, you know, moving yeah. your factors around and you're trying to, you know, when my customers get on the boat, I try to put the customer in the best position that they can. Like, you know, well, why is the boat in problems now? I'm like, dude, we're going tuna fishing. We're that much closer to the ground. It's giving you a little bit more time to fish. Oh, okay, you know, and it's like, you know, and for a little while there, because basically now that the fishery has kind of rebuilt itself and everything's so good, like I'd be down in Chatham sometimes, or I'd yeah. be, you know, I'd be different spots, um, you know, and just try to try to reinvent something. The, I will tell you one thing that I would like to do, and it's not tuna fishing, and I'm, I'm itching and I'm dying to do it, is to go and kill a halibut. 
I would Same. love to do it. It's a, it's a big bucket. So that's what we were talking about. Something like that. Yeah. So you'd want to spend two weeks during but, prime I mean, time. But but these guys, you know, I know we all know Gil Netters. We all know guys, and they're like, oh, you just go right here. He's like, we catch them all the time. We're like, well, how big are they? He's like, well, he's like, I don't know exactly how big they are, but we got a we have an eight inch mesh net, so we're getting this specific size in the net. And I wanted to do it like just before COVID had happened. We like we were we had planned a trip and we were gonna go and do it. And it was springtime and it was just like, you know, I have no clue. And like the guy that's caught all those tunas with me, he wants to go and do it. I'm like, bro, I can't, I'm not gonna take you. I'm not gonna charge you to go fishing. I've never even caught one myself. Like this is just like a personal thing that yeah. hell, I'll pay for it. I'll go, you know, you know, yeah. and no type of thing. So he wants to do that. We might, we might try it next year, but a halibut would be really be cool, cool thing in that some of these you talk to some of these old timers like they were catching them off the race like 15 years ago yeah, and crazy. big ones they're like three four hundred pounders my dad had one try to eat his kite on the high ground at the corner no shit yep and one of our charter customers got an absolute donkey they tried last year nick logan they did um they got like not two, nick logan two uh, nick um scott oh, nick scott yeah it was like 200 pounds. Yeah, it? I have the tail in my free. Yeah. So my one halibut story that I can tell you about the Northeast was, is we're, you know, trying to jig up bottom bait out there on, on Georgia's and then we, I hooked one. I mean, it, it, there's no, you know what it is, you know, it's just yeah. like making these and I'm on a, a little tiny, like 16 VS or something, you know, and I'm working on this thing and nobody else would touch it. You know, like I'm not God, touching that thing. I'm like, all right, screw it. I'm like, this is a halibut for sure. I'm going to catch this thing. And you know, fishing. There's a few fish around. Their stuff's biting, whatever, a little bit. And I'm I'm on this thing for like 25 minutes. And you know, it's a little tiny rod. It's it's taking time. I'm like halfway up. Double. We took the double. I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. I just look up at the sky. I cut the line, and we went and caught the double. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to lose this thing. You know, it's on, it's on braid. So you know, these tuners are flying around. You know, there's boats. There's you know, it's just like, and we caught both fish. So you know, I mean, that's you know, that's what we're there for. But that was my only experience with a house. <laughs> yeah, this picture back on. Holy shit. George's is fun. I mean, I don't know how many tunas I've ever caught in my life, but, uh, you know, if we did the average of, you know, all the years that I've been doing it, last, not this season, but last season would have been the, the year that I broke a thousand. That's sick. And I don't, like I said, I don't know the, the exact number, but. That's awesome. It's a big number. That is a big number. It's sweet. And it's like, okay, if you caught a thousand, how many have you lost? No shit. You know, I probably lost four or five hundred. No shit. As Doesn't you, even you know, phase me you, anymore. When you're younger and you're like trying trying to learn how to do stuff, I mean, obviously this is a this, this game that we it's a game that we play. I mean, it's, it's yeah. a game, mm -hmm. and sometimes you lose and sometimes you win. But there was a lot more losing in the beginning, and then you kind of redefine stuff and maybe simplify stuff even yeah. more so than redefining things and knowing what you you know. On my extra long leaders that I use and my light leaders that I use, not. <laughs> uh, but you know, you, like, what is your go to? Like, I've heard rumors of like 200, 180. Like, what, like, you're going to just go to an efficient what's, what's on there for leader? Um, 180 and 220. 180 and 220. Yeah, that's basically what I use. The 220 is more so for in the kite or if we go offshore. Yeah. I mean, those fish are, I mean, we, like my mate was trying to get me to do it, and uh, and I didn't do it. And now I wish I had because, you know, I had all the, the gear on the boat for the green stick and all that stuff. And he breaks out a piece of 700. He's like, just do it. I'm like, <laughs> like we don't need the 700. We're catching them on 300, you know. Like, And I wished I had done it, you know, just to say that I caught one on 700. Because they were literally soaking us on the back of the boat, like, yeah. as fast as you could go. And it was like, it was cool. Like, you, you know, I've never been to Canada to do all that stuff. But those fish would get into a rhythm, and it's like 500, 500, 500, 800. Yeah. 500, 500, 500, 800. So if you wanted to hook that 800, you just you just let them go through their cycle and keep sw swimming around that. and kind of doing all that stuff. Yeah. And that's what we were doing out there. It was pretty neat. The coolest thing that I thought we did in Canada was uh, we just tied a deadly dick to the header and flew it on the kite like 15 feet behind the boat. And just sat there for like hours filming kite bites. Yeah, we were just, just straightening out the sick, sickle tail, dorsal sickle yeah. tail. The little tiny over trouble. and over. Just, yeah, straighten the hook. Yeah, just straightening it out. Repin them on. That was one of the most fun I've ever had with tuna it in my life. Fun. Like 
kite bites five feet off the transom over and over yeah. and over again. The dredge by the herring boat. So Taylor, that was sick. When he, when he was building tackle, it rode, uh, put the troll pro in the dredge. Mm-hmm. And we just trolled all around the, the herring boats. And we get back to the house in the evening. We had some great days. Get back to the house in the evening, reviewing the footage. And it's just like nothing, 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 nothing. We're all like, you know, fucking kind of bummed out. And then, uh, I just remember the Eureka moment with you, and it's just like all of a sudden, one of the we get to that point in the footage, and it's just like, yeah, there's like six like fish chasing the dredge. Fucking in the dredge, and we were running like a, I, we rigged like a bronze with like a chugger head on it. Remember that was above it, behind it. you could yeah. see the fish come up and look at it, and then peel off onto the dredge. Yeah, it was cool. just really, really yeah, cool up cool there. Stuff. It's there's awesome. nothing better than hooking them out of hand. No. I mean, there's nothing in out there like. You know, we with my short leaders and all that stuff, I would have the swivel in my hand and to, to have a little loop, like touching the, you know, the bait is literally yeah. four feet off the side of the boat. They're like literally scratching their backs on the keel. Sick. And they're just taking it and you're splashing and your glasses are all wet and just lock it up and, you know. So, I, and I would tell my mates every time, like when I, when we were, when I was hooking them out of the hand, just put the boat in gear. We're so close to the yeah. back of the boat. Like there's no room for error. Just like if, the, the, if I tell you to put the boat in gear, you don't need to idle up or anything. Just put the boat in gear and just start pulling away. And yeah. that way, you know, you're not going to break them off under the keel or in the wheel or whatever the story might be. And perfecting your hook set too. That's sweet. Um, we've been going for an hour and a half, boys. What other, what, other, what other fun things do you have? Oh. Any theories in the bay of how fish move, how you think fish move? I've, I've been saying it for years. The bay is just a big fish bowl. Um, obviously, we've got the ledge in the middle of the bay. And I can honestly tell you, I've never caught one on top of the ledge. Yeah. Um, and part of that problem is, is because of all the lobster gear that's up there. Yeah. I mean, you can, the bay is just, you know, people are, oh, you got to be right here. I'm like, no, dude, you don't. There's no structure in here. They're just swimming around. They'll go over here, you know, up off a of churro on the inside and off, off the path and all that stuff. They'll go whack some bluefish or whatever story may be. And, they, you know, they have their spots where there's bait and, and stuff like that. And I'm sure that if you could spend a bunch of time on the ledge itself, like you could probably get some bites. But I think it's just, a, it's a, it's just, a generic thing like it's just they're just swimming around in there there's food in their form like we don't see it all all the time like in the boats and what we're not yeah. marking on the machine and all that stuff but you know how many times have you guys caught a fish in the bay and then you cut it open and it's got mackerel squid pogies whiting yeah bluefish stripers mm-hmm. i mean all these different so there's obviously enough food for them like it baffles me sometimes how many fish are actually in the bay like you know, even even this year, early on, we get to the September opener and all that stuff, and there's so many people fishing because it's close to shore. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the little boats can, all those guys can get there and all that stuff, and there'll be, you know, there'll be 80, 90 fish hooked in the bay in the day. It's crazy, it's insane. And that's like, I'm not even talking about other stuff like up off of Plymouth and back up towards where you guys are. Stone, I mean, Stone Ledge isn't really in the bay, but it, it's part of the it's part of the the whole operation, and the fish are kind of flashing in and out. But as far as the bay fishing goes. You know, we get, we anchor because it, sometimes when it's rough, just because it's that short chop, and that short chop is just so painful. You know, you got it's so much better to be out on the bank or something like that where the the, the sea is a little. They might be bigger, but they're spread apart. You know, yeah. we get this short little chop. And Sucks the, on the drift. The the duffy is you know it goes through it great, but it rolls back and forth a little bit, and all of a sudden you're like, what is going on? It's like flat calm out here, and you know you're just getting you're getting thrashed around. But no, as far as bay fishing goes. You know, I have my theories as to some of these angles and the approaches that our fish are taking when they're coming in from the outside. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, like go back to the 2020 again. And that was an insane year. And they were biting up inside Provincetown Harbor. Yeah. You guys remember yep. that? Yep. Other, I mean, like the guys in the, be, in the friggin' They anchorage. would be biting in the harbor. Yeah. And the guys would be the, the fleet. There's just a massive fleet anchored up for one. Because there's lobster gear and stuff in there. And if everybody's anchoring, then the guys that are drifting are, are going to get screwed up and, and all that. So, so everybody's anchored up in there. And, you know, we would be, you know, I take my charter when we needed to catch bait or we were doing something prior to going tuna fishing, stuff like that. Or maybe I did have bait. Now, this one particular instance, I did have the bait. And I steamed right by everybody because it hadn't happened yet. And I'm like, 
my my guys are like, what are these guys doing? I said, they're tuna fishing. And they're like, well, why aren't we going there? I'm like, because they're not biting in here yet. I said, they got to come from somewhere to get here because it's just a little pocket that's yeah. up inside. Yeah. I'm like, if they haven't got here yet, then they're they're not in here yet. Yeah. And we go out there and, you know, my, you know, people who know me know that Wood End Bell is a big, big spot. I caught a lot of, a lot of tunas right there. And we go in and we, we chuck, and it would be like 10 minutes and we'd be on. And then I'd call a couple people and then other people would see, you know, my boat is like a turd in a punch bowl, man. Everybody can see me from oh, yeah. a mile oh, yeah. away. It's easy. And so if I'm sitting there doing circles, here comes the, and, and it would be like, you know, that kind of proved my theory as to kind of what I was thinking, but that was in a spot that, there's only one way for them to get there. It's one way in, one way out. Mm -hmm. It's a sick funnel right there. Yeah. Well, it's deep. It's deep in, in spots, but I mean, it's just a travel corridor. And you try to learn some of that stuff and like the stuff on the west side of the bay, it's hard to judge. Um, you know, but just like that, that pinnacle point there yeah. closer to Provincetown. But that was because there was so much bait that was up inside and those fish had a pattern. They were all going in there every day. Yeah. Maybe that's not the pattern that has happened. I haven't. I think I've caught one fish at Wood End in the last three years, hmm. two years. So I the haven't pogey, spent much time the, in there. The pogey biomass kind of shifted slightly, though, right? So well, like, it was so big that first year. Yeah. And then you think that it would kind of like ripple it in a direction where okay, it's going to be a much better, and it probably is better than it used. It's definitely better than it used to be. Yeah. But I remember when I was a kid, like ten years old. And at my dock in uh, in Orleans, and we're tidal where we're at, and the the whole they were dying in the harbor at low tide because there were so many of them that were in there and they couldn't breathe. Yeah. When the tide goes out, and then you know they were, so they were all. And, but and we haven't seen that in years. But I mean, the, there's the that whole pogey thing, like, you know, just, just find the bait. You know, drive around in the bay. I'm, I might. There's there's been days where I've driven like thirty miles before I put a line in the water. Yeah. But when I put the line in, we get tight pretty quick. Yep. It's definitely a, I mean, we've been fishing down there more in the last, what, four years or so? It's yeah. a patience. It's a it patience is. thing. You have to be patient. And knowing like what, like what looks good on your machine or on the surface there is so drastically different from what, like, but you can also, what we want to fish. You can also bank. throw all that stuff out and literally see nothing. Yeah. And still get to bite. Yeah. Um, well, where are the whales? Where are the birds? Like, no. No, yeah. you just got to be patient. And I had a buddy of mine that was like, he talked to his wife and um, I, I wasn't even charter. I just took him fishing because I go hunting this place in Alabama. And he's talking to his wife. Oh, it's pretty slow here in the Bay today. There's not really much going on. And, um, you know, whatever. He's got a, I had a charter to do that afternoon. So I just had the morning off to go take him tuna fishing before I went and, you know, did my charter. And uh, he gets off the phone with his wife. I'm like, look, I said, it might not seem like there's much going on here, um, but it's the bay. I said, we're in a fishbowl, and it just random. And no sooner did I say that, we're tight. Yeah. And we lost the fish. Yeah. And he's like, i got to call my wife back. <laughs> <laughs> so he calls his wife back. He's like, Captain Brad was just telling me, you know, that this, that, and this about the bay and blah, blah, blah. And we hooked one. We ended up losing it. And he's on the phone with his wife, and we hook another one. <laughs> That's, That's amazing. Sick. And um and we caught that fish and we're fighting and I was doing like this live thing on, on Instagram um, where, where I went live and I'm, we're, you know, just like, oh, my buddy Frank's up here, we're out here whining on, a, whining on the big one. And my charter calls me that I have at noontime. <laughs> He's like, that's a live video. He's like, I'm supposed to see you in an hour and a half. I'm like, don't worry, I'll be there. <laughs> and I was like... I'm like, dude, we got to like push it up, push it up. And it was a big, it was a big fish. It's like a 110 incher. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, and we, we get him to the boat and you know, he's a little bit cross-eyed. I'm like, no, we got to take the time. We put the, we put the swim hook in him. And I said, look, I said, we're just going to kind of get regrouped here and just kind of swim him towards the, you know, swim him towards port. I put tag in him and all that stuff. And, yep. and we turned him loose and I had to, I had to, I did run pretty hard to get in for my trip, but <laughs> that's an epic day though. But it was, it was, it was cool. And he's like, I did not think, and it was, it was my booking and it was a four boat trip. Like I had four, three other charter boats booked and they're already like, 
Yeah. You know, I'm screaming down the <laughs> down the tree line. I'm like, I I got like, you know, I'm I'm doing like 19 knots. I'm like, my poor boat, you know, I never run the boat that hard. <laughs> and I shovel the guy off. Actually, I think my buddy stayed on the boat. He's like, you guys don't mind if I and it's like, yeah. You know, he's just hung up on the bridge with me. We didn't have a full group. So he just hung up on the bridge with me. And he's like, man, he's like, it's so crazy to go from one extreme to the other. Like, how do you turn it off? Like you just caught a, you know, it was probably 110 inch or, you know, so you, you're looking at a, a 750, something like that. Yeah. And, and like two hours later, we're like excited about 30 inch stripers, you know? Like, I feel like you need that when you're chartering every day, you need that change of pace. Well, you got to put yourselves in the perspective of the client though, yeah. too. like an eight hour trip or, you know, they're going to spend a thousand bucks to go inshore fishing for eight hours, you know? So a thousand bucks, you know, it is, it's not short money. Like yeah. if, especially if it's just a couple of guys, but if, I mean, obviously to go and charter fish and do all that stuff, it's more of a frivolous thing. It's not something that's mandatory. So that's the, that's the, the side that we all have to play with, you know, recessions, um, you know, just financial crap that we got to deal with that, that the world's dealing with but it, it it completely reflects us because we're just we're just the we're just a fun Disposable thing to do income you know so you know you have to look at it from that perspective and you you know you put the, you know whatever we might be fishing for now i've learned a little a lot about my little corner of the bay where i fish so i've got all these spots where there's rocks there's wrecks and there's we'll go catch our stripers you know you you i'll just touch on this real quick before we end because yeah, yeah. this is a big part of what we do like you guys do the river. All, all your all your fishing in the river and you guys are hammering these things but you and you don't have to go far and you've got a great fishery but you know you're e even if you're not burning that much fuel to go and do it and the cost of clients are spending a thousand bucks to go with you or whatever the story may be you know you're you want to try to give them the best scenario that you can so when they took this, then slowly slowly they've been taking the stripers away from us mm -hmm. you know and then this past year with the three inch window and on all that stuff and it was hard to get and then we had so many fish that would be over the the limit yeah. and we'd have to work and spend extra time to just to try and get our limit of one per person and we're hammering the stripers oh yeah but they're too big or they're too small because there's only three inch window um when it went from two stripe because it used to be you know uh 28 to 28 inches minimum and two fish per person type of thing and then it went to 20 to 35 and one fish and, you know, slowly but surely everything's kind of going to going away. Well, that made me more diversified with what I do. And I have a big group of clientele that want to go flounder fishing. And we have an awesome flounder fishery down there where I'm at. The togs. I mean, we got we got a really good ground fishing and you can go and catch some of these fish on at any given time. But the bay is known for ripping wire you know those guys love to rip wire i hate the wire i'll we use it if i have to same. but i i hate i hate to use the wire so you know you you just become a little bit more diversified and and you start seeing these people that have been fishing on these other boats right there next to me and they see the tackle that we're using and they'll go and jig for stripers for eight hours well we got our limit no we're just going to keep doing this because they're not going to go bottom fish and they're not going to, you know, go and do something completely different. And, oh, my guys are so wiped out. I'm like, dude, you've been doing this for six and a half hours, just ripping wire the whole time. So all these people are gravitating towards, hey, you know, we see that you're catching fish or they'll, they'll, they'll hop on Instagram or see what we're doing or, or see what we have for tackle out. And, you know, some days all I got is these little tiny jigs and, and there's no wire line. There's not even the biggest, the biggest thing we've got out is a, you know, a 12 VS, 12 VIS for trolling for stripers, you know, if, if we're trolling and, and it wasn't, they might not even have gotten used that day, you know, yeah. type of thing. So I know. wish we had like a, a few more reliable species up towards where we are, but we just kind of pivot on our tactics. Like, you know, if we know if we can put the limb in the box with live bait and chum and chunk yeah. in. And then once that's done and the tide drops out, you're like, you want to go like fish the creeks on 10 pound test, yeah. you know, just fishing spooks yeah, but and get like a, way up inside. Like, this is, we should have done this the whole well, you're, day. Yeah, you're no. giving them an option, but it's a fun option instead yeah. of ripping 40 pound wire. The whole time. Yeah. The whole time. Now, granted it works, man. I mean, yeah. I, I've caught a lot of fish on the wire. I hate it with a passion, but you know, it, sometimes it'll be like, even on the backside of P-Town, like if they weren't biting the verticals out, cause we were catching them right where we were trolling all summer long if you're doing a drift with live bait we were catching our limit sick and and we you know and like we'd have to pull the downline up just because 
there's so many of them falling up, they would eat the down line. So yeah. we got the kite out, you get your stuff, the, the, and we we would get, we did have some bites while we were fighting stripers and we hooked a tuna, but, that's sick. um, you know, but you're giving them a different option and it's something that's fun. It's not going to wear them out physically, you know? Yeah. And, you know, that's part of the problem with the bay is that they, it's gotten the name of just like, oh, all you guys do is rip wire over there. And it's like, okay, you know, yeah, because it's true, but it's not even like. To add on to it too, it's not even like the diversified experience or species. If you have, you know, a new angler and they kind of like get into fighting fish, traditional, like traditional river fishing, drifting back chunks, live baits, and you kind of, like, you build their skill for them. They appreciate that. I feel yeah. like well, we have a lot Slow of- Slow down, lift your rod. Exactly. You know? And it's like- Or we... they suck at casting. Well, let's go try this and get your casting better, yeah. you know? Um just being aware of those things, I feel like is super helpful and super helpful and like just making that relationship well, way it. more Again, personal. And they're spending a bunch of money. I mean, it's not, in, in our terms, it's not like crazy amounts of money just because we've got so much overhead in this fishery yeah. now. Like the, the stuff that we didn't have 20 years ago, it's like everything's five times more expensive yeah. than it used to be. So, you know, when the fuel went uh, increased... And I tell I tell my mates I'm like get the, you know you're gonna have to have the wire line ready, just in case. Instead of like, well they're not biting here. Let me go three miles that way and to another spot and see if we can't get them this way. Well, you have to start thinking in your head as far as what you guys are doing. Like, okay, well, if it's six miles to the next spot, fuel's five bucks a gallon because it was five bucks and it's, now it's down to four thirty or something. I probably yeah. the average was probably four thirty a gallon this year type of thing. So you have to kind of take some of that part out of the equation. And it kind of depends on the people too. Like I'll explain it to them. Like people like guys, this is where I kind of where we're at. Like I, if I go six miles this way, come back six miles that way, and I get a big boat, so I'm a gallon a mile like yeah. type of thing. All right, so that's that's eighty dollars, seventy dollars in fuel just to go six miles one way and six miles back and you can't you can't you know in our heads if you're catching fish if there's fish to catch you know you're leaving fish to go find fish to try and catch them in a different manner so that's where that's where the, the fine line kind of comes into you have to be ready for it and be difficult and i just you know it's like okay guys let's just do this just get our limit you know type of type of thing if we need to use the wire and, and granted I, again i hate it i hate it with a passion it drives me crazy and, and you know the only time i ever like using the, the wire and the jigs is when i can sight fish the schools mm. and i'll just put them halfway out and i'm like okay i said i you know i got a, I got a school 300 yards up and then as we get close me like all right get ready get ready get ready drop them the rest of the way because we're just basically trolling the jigs at that point yeah and it's like boom 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 and they're like 40 pounders, you know, Sick. and so that's kind of fun to do from that perspective. But that's, um, yeah, no, that's great. It's all great. Uh, be diversified, be different, you know, think outside the box, you know, and like what you guys are doing, fishing in the river and then go to the ultralight stuff, and, you know, but maybe, maybe get outside and find, you know, if you guys got some sandy areas or some flat, a flat area, dude, go and drift it. And, yeah, and, we were doing and that put, a lot last year. Put, some, put some flounder rigs out or put a fluke rig out, a jig, or, or, or try, you know, and who knows what you might find. There's been some guys picking away at the togs, you know, on the rocks down off, you know, kind of off Hum Rock and Green Harbor that we've never really explored. And we did have a good squirt of bluefish for, for a bit there, too. So it was nice to kind of go in the river and then bump out, troll around when the tide sucked. It's got to be some rock piles and stuff up there, though. Yeah. Uh, oh, there's tog there and stuff. It's just we've speared them and had good luck. It's just never fucking had good luck on the rods mm -hmm. you know well the thing that i have been doing is like you know and i get a little bit of overflow from a buddy of mine but you know he did the on the water thing and mike fowler yeah yeah no bad dog and, and you know he did this thing with the tv show and he's just jammed with uh with the guys coming from new york to go flounder fishing and some tog groups and stuff like that and i tell you what I've learned more from those guys that come up that have been doing it for a long period of time. Like my life is easy when those guys are on the boat because whether they're flounder fishing or whether they're togging or whatever the story may be, obviously, you know, you go different spots for either species, but you just sit back and, and just watch what these guys are doing and they're hammering them. Sick. And it's like, then you go and take a charter out that, that doesn't know what they're doing. And it's like, ah, you want to pull your hair out. And, and that way the mate and I are, you know, trying to teach a little bit. I like to use the spinners more because you got your left-handed and right-handed people. And, 
you can move the handles around where the conventional so you can't you can't move so the people seem to enjoy that like oh well i'm left-handed okay just back it out oh that's great you know and as i go to grab the rod i'm like yeah <laughs> i don't like trying to reel the wrong way and i'm like dude, that's I, I, pulled it. I still can't reel i can't spinning do it rod like that dude it's hard. but you see all these internet things and people have always got the the handle on the wrong side or uh -huh. to you you and i would yeah. be the wrong side everybody's yeah. fishing with the handle on the on the right hand side i'm like how you know uh, are there that many left-handed people out there i don't know you shoot a bow righty or lefty <sighs> when i'm able to pull yeah, a string when you're able back, to pull it back. Uh, no I, I i'm pulling back with my right same. I'm a righty, but I shoot lefty. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, it seems to work for you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Very, very. See if you can replicate that next year. Pressure's on. Pressure's on now, for sure. Oh, I had people call me. It's like, what's going on? Brian, those guys haven't even been hunting that long, and they're killing giants. I'm like, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> I said, I, I know where that spot is. And I'm like, dude, I said, it is a spot like no other, no other. And I'm like, yeah. that's why I told you. I said, you go yeah. sell this house. It's like, I'm buying <laughs> <laughs> But no, it, it's, it's, it's awesome that you have, have that here. Yeah. The spot's like, great. Um, you know, I travel around a lot and I've seen some really cool stuff and I've had opportunities at some giants and something's gone wrong. You know, I mean, I've got a lot of those, you know, 130, 135, you know, maybe pushing 140 deer, which is still a great deer, oh, yeah. but but it's like I want you know yeah. that Midwest giant, and I, dude, I've had so many things that have gone wrong. I'm like, dude, I swear that I'm not like don't have buck fever or whatever, but something always seems to go wrong. I had a fletch come off. I mean, a huge mainframe ten. He's like a 160. I had him at 22 yards with nothing in my way, and the fletch came off my arrow when I shot. And it missed. Fuck. I'm like, how does that happen? And then... Would this, your release just not drop away and your fletching I, caught or no, something? No, I just let go and I did the thing. And I mean, you just watch the arrow just away. go... Poof, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it's like a boomerang. Oh, God. <laughs> it, it landed right at his ass. I'm like, well, wait a minute. What happened? I mean, and this thing, I mean, it's a giant. So it's, it, it's every bit of 160. Huge. Trash hanging off of him and all sorts of stuff. And it's just like... Fuck. I can't believe I just missed it. Like, and then the next day or that evening, like now that now I'm kind of busted, you know, well, not really busted in the area, but I had seen that was the second day I seen that same deer. I couldn't get a shot at him because it was, the, it was kind of open and I went to draw and he kind of, he kind of jumped away, but yeah. he came back the next day. And then, you know, that, that evening I, there was this doe that came in and all the other does are like slowly working their way up because you, you know we're in Ohio. You can you can bait there and all that yeah. stuff. And and there's this one doe. I call her Miss Piggy. She was thirty pounds bigger than any other doe, and she didn't wait for nothing. She just came barreling straight in, and she could just just crunching away the whole time. I'm like Miss Piggy comes in tonight. I'm gonna <laughs> yeah, whack she's her. Done. So the same situation is in the same exact spot. I and I shoot her, and she goes thirty yards and piles up. Like how, how did this just happen? Like the biggest deer of my life, I just blew at 22 yards, you know, and like the doe comes in and I shoot her and she goes 20 yards or 30 yards and she's piled up. Like I, I, I can literally see her and take a video from the tree yeah. looking at the deer. But You'll get redemption. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's definitely a, um. It's a vice for me type of thing, you know, to try and unwind from a crazy long tuna season. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, you know, I, now I go to Florida to do my tournaments and stuff like that. And I don't drive anymore. Like I won a lot of tournaments and do, did a lot where I drove and my buddy does it now. And, um, you know, he, he does a good job and we've won tournaments and I've been, you know, part of all this stuff. But I need some de decompression time. Yeah. You know, it's like not having to make all the decisions all the time. Um, and as you guys get older, you'll start to, you'll start to recognize that where you, I'm already feeling it. Just having to inter, like, I love having new people on the boat every day, but I definitely need my like alone time now yeah. for a few weeks. Anyway. And the tree is what does it for me. Like I, I love being in the woods. I I hunted a lot of days. I passed on a lot of animals and you know, I'm, I have no regrets for anything that I did this year. Like, you know, I shot a big one out in Kansas and it went on another property and we couldn't go get it. But I've shot, I shot three deer this year and I got two of them and That's awesome. I couldn't, we weren't allowed to go on the other property, which kind of stinks. You know, you, you go out there that far and you're doing all that stuff. And it's like, 
uh, you know, the, the landowners don't get along with each other. I'm like, you know, I didn't, I don't have anything to do with this. Like I just, you know, yeah. came out here, but it's, it's part of the game. So you just kind of let it, let it roll off your back. But no, it's, it's good to, it's good to get a little decompression time. And my buddy who runs that tournament boat, well, he came up and made it for me for a couple of weeks this year and his mind was blown. He's never caught one. Well, he did. He caught one with me in the bay. You know, he wound on it and his wife was up here with him and, um, they came up, you know, a few years earlier and, it was kind of it was kind of uneventful. We caught one, and you know, you know, we, it was closed. It was November or whatever, and he's like, you know, thirty feet from the boat and on the surface, and you see him, and you just pull it off, and I'm like, yeah, you know, long distance release type thing. Yeah. We weren't doing anything with it anyhow. You know, yeah, we're gonna yeah. let it go. But he was blown away. He, we caught the biggest fish of the year. We caught this year was eight thirty, and um, he was on the boat for that. That's sick. That was down so inside the bay, and that was a horrendous fish. Is that afternoon that big sickle fish, mm -hmm. big sickle fin picture you have? Yeah, that I think should you be got, on the were there. That, I was there. We we had wrapped one up, then you hooked up after. Yeah, we exactly. Left. Yeah, that picture of you with the harpoon should be on a magazine. Yeah, cover. it should be. That picture is sick. It's unbelievable. It's like black back. Oh. It's going away. It's going away. He's and back. He's, oh he's kicking, yeah, yeah. You know, you can see the water it's, coming it, off the it tail. It honestly looks like that. Uh, yeah, I remember painting. that picture. He's like angled away. You commented on. Oh, oh, dude, I've got it right here. I mean, that's that's like that was a um, that was that was an unbelievable shot. I'll have you send me that so George can throw it in the podcast. Uh, where is it here? Oh, here we go. Um, you know, you look at my I look at my phone and there's like five thousand pictures of freaking tunas that one right there is probably yes. the one you're talking about yeah that picture is sick yeah. ridiculous yeah it, it was such a great shot with the pen with the pen sticker in the in the corner there yep. too it's, yeah it's we gotta like... give our shout out to pen and pure yeah. fishing yeah you know? exactly um but um yeah i'll send you that picture to stuff too it'd be it, sweet it, it was it's that was an epic shot for sure you should get a couple clips of george's too to tie in with yeah if you have a post a, we'll follow up with you after this to yeah. grab a couple things so we can plug them in there there's nothing better than having five six hundred pounders laying on the deck dude some of the pictures like again back to when we started this conversation and looking at all your shit forever even before we got to know you some of those fucking george's pictures you have are unbelievable and it was epic like as it as it seemed like you know as fishermen from one fisherman to another like as cool as those pictures were, it was is just as cool in you know in person. Yeah. But uh, oh, and then one of those things I was gonna do the, a quick story that it was the 2011 year on George's bank because you can cut and paste all this yeah, stuff yeah, anyhow. Yeah. But um, the fishing was tough. The fishing was real tough, and that was the time that I told you I spent six days out there. Like, you know, we we went out slow, so we didn't burn any that much fuel, and I hold I hold 480 gallons. I put 450 on when I came back, you know, and I had to go slow the whole way. Like generator had quit, you know, I'm like, all right, well, I've got, you know, at this speed, I, I, there's enough in the tank and should, we should have 10 gallons up. My mate's like 10 gallons. What are you talking about? Like I said, well, at least be close to home if we run out. And I had been gone and, you know, I just like, you know, I had, this, I had the sat phone and stuff on the boat, but I just didn't, you know, we just, you know, doing my thing. I check in with my wife or my girlfriend at the time, whatever. And that's basically, I said, just tell everybody we're fine. It, the weather was beautiful. And it was like this long stretch of just beautiful weather. And the fish were not biting. And it was one of those days where there was like, it started out where there was a hundred boats. And, um, and my buddy pulled up to me. He's like, what are you going to do? I said, well. I said, they're not biting that well, but I'm going to let like all these boats leave and then I'm going to get my fish because there's just, I mean, as big of an area as it was, everybody's trying to fish. It was, we were just learning that spot, you know, yeah. and we weren't trying to escape too far away from it. And, uh, anyway, it's like two days, two days goes by and we, we catch our first one and, you know, then now that we're down to like 10 boats that are left out there and it's just the diehard guys that just commercial tuna fisherman that's all that's left and we had satellite tv on the boat so we've got a little bit of like the, i think the television and watching sports center or whatever because i like to watch sports and all that stuff that helped keep my mind in the in the game like yeah. some sort of sanity to to keep yourself from just staring at rods and balloons and, and trying to figure out the next move you know you're, you're doing your thing that you always do you know that it works you just got to get the fish to you know swim by the hook and and make a decision but it was like another day we caught one and then the next day we lost one and then the next day um 
it, we were allowed three at the time. And we're out there on the hang line. We're like fishing right on the line. And of course, it's pulling east. So you're constantly like trying to reset. There was a pile of bait that was there and all that stuff. We had lost one. And the Coast Guard had showed up. And the guys are like, you know, we had two on the boat. We lost one and we're, we're looking for the one or our ticket home. You know, we were getting ready to go home probably that day anyway, because we were going to be out of fuel. And so everybody starts racing away from the Coast Guard like, like they're not going to board you. Like we're 150 miles <laughs> no, out. They're going to get each and every one of us. Yeah. And, you know, the whole, the whole, the, the whole story goes like, I don't know how, how it all will pan out if I get the call from somebody someday. Well, we, we, <laughs> We're going over there, and we're just we're we're on our drift, and the guys are like, "You're not going to move." I'm like, "No, dude." I said, "I got all my safety equipment. That's all they want to know is your safety equipment." I said, "But I'll probably I'm going to let them board me, and we're going to keep drifting, and I'm going to hook one." Yeah, <laughs> and that's what happened. No way. No, we shit. hooked one, and we hooked the fish on our side, but the tide had pulled us over on 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 the other side, so. You know, and those guys, the Coast Guard guys, they're all young kids, you know, and I, 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 you know, I know some of the kids from Florida and all that stuff. So, you you know how some of the aspects of all the, these young, young guys work. Well, they know that they can't impede on, on your fishing. And they are just like, you know, they're just in the guy, one guy will be over here, like pulling his iPhone out. I'm like, guys, <laughs> just relax. I said, this is a big deal. I said, it's like 600 pound fish. I said, enjoy it. I said, just call that Zodiac off. Yeah. Tell them to stay the hell away. So anyway, long story short, we catch the fish. And now these guys want to get back to their job and stuff that they need to do. He's like, well, I need your lat long. I'm like, I can't give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, no, no, no. I, I need the I need the lat long. Uh, we did. Like, again, we hooked the fish on our side. Yeah. But we, we were in Canadian waters now at this point. And uh, the, the the funny part is the guy's like, his eyes are coming up and said, you need to take the direct. I'm like, dude, I'm going due west. I can't go any straighter to get back. And we were only like a half a mile over it. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, we were yeah. technically over that line. But the guy's eyes were coming out of his head. I'm like, we're, we're not in U.S. waters right now. What? And I'm like, well, the tide pulled us over here. You know, if you guys didn't board me, I would have reset. Yeah. And to stay over, you know, like, and, and I caught, but I called my shot. I'm like, oh, I'm going to let him board me and hook one. Yep. That's fucking crazy. But at the end of that, so we got our three fish and, you know, some of those guys didn't have any, any, maybe one or none or type of thing. And we, we came in cause we were just out, we we're out of food, we we're out of fuel, we we're out of everything. And I get on the, uh, on the, on the phone when I get back in and I call the, call the tuna buyer. Where the hell have you been? I'm like. Dude, I'm about to make your day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, you know, it's like the, the, the ones that people talk about. Because every every client that gets on your boat thinks a tuna's worth 10 grand. Yeah. I got paid 29000 in change for those three fish. There was no fish coming in anywhere, and they're all beauties. Wow. So it was 29 and change. And that's like, other than that, I can count, you know, on one hand how many times I've been paid 10 grand for a tuna, you know? Yeah. I can count on one finger the amount of times I've been paid for 10, 10 grand or more for a tuna. Well, that's the nice part. Well, me being older and seeing the heyday of how all that stuff went down, and we would we would see the I mean mega prices. But sick, I was a wild child, and I burned through it really quick. Yeah, and so but th that was the good part. I mean, at least I learned my lesson, and now I'm like way better with my finances. But I had a good time. <laughs> you only live once, you know. That's it. Well, dude, we could sit here. I could sit here all day yeah. and talk about oh, it's this been shit. Fun. Easy. It's been awesome. It's been fun. It gives a different perspective from the charter side and, and the, the changing over as to, you know, what you guys are dealing with now and what I've evolved to and knowing that this is the this is the best way for us to make our money, you know, doing the right things as far as the clients go, it, you know, in their best interest. You're doing it what they, you can for their best interest. And that's how my my business is 95 percent repeat in yeah. referral. So you don't have that many new people as you're as you're kind of rolling along. It's it's nice. It takes the pressure off, allows you to fish better. That's the ultimate goal. Yeah, you and, know? But at the same time, even if the fish aren't biting, like the people know that the effort is has, has been That's put what I in. Mean. It's like you can just, they know. They know it's going to happen or it's not. And they, You're not you trying know, to explain why they're not biting. Be disgruntled or like, oh, geez, you know, we only had one tuna bite today. I'm like, dude, we had a bite, you know, like yeah. we didn't, if they didn't get the fish, you know, it's one thing if you do get it. I'm like, I tell people you're a hero or zero. I mean, like you're, you know, we're fishing for giant 
you know, trophy fish, whether we're going to tag it and let it go or whether we're trying to kill it or whether we're trying to, you know, get a recreational fish. I mean, this recreational thing is, is, is really great. Yeah. It's really great. And for it to come back the way that it's come back and, you know, I know you got the center console boat and you're zipping around some, but you're, you kind of stick to some of the same tactics that we do. We might be trolling around a little bit sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I hooked up some tunas off the bridge on a spinning rod this year. Like, Sick. you know, and I'm like, take the boat out of gear. <laughs> I'm like hanging off the side of the boat, <laughs> yeah, doing yeah. all that stuff. But, you know, whether you're bait fishing, and that's what we mostly do is all bait fishing, yeah. a little bit of trolling mixed in and, and stuff like that. But, you know, our fishery is, is thriving. Um, it's a good, it's a good thing. And you guys are in a great spot. You guys have a great business already rolling and, uh, you know, Looking you're gonna have you're gonna have all that clientele soon enough where you're just like everybody's i mean i have guys that oh, we want the same day next year i'm like bro you got a call because i had that happen like oh i haven't heard from you but we're gonna we're going fishing tomorrow i'm like you never called me yeah oh i said i wanted the same day i'm like no you got you gotta still reach it's out still a business it's still a well system. yeah but i'm like i just tell people like hey i'm not taking bookings yeah. until the first of the year and now it's like I started taking bookings. I went against my will. The boat was still in the water, and I went and got a book and started putting people back in the book. And the boat hasn't even come out yet. You know, <laughs> we're lucky. Our, you know, Wendy Sears, our mother, she's just like on it when it comes to that shit. So yeah, that's great. It's nice to have for sure. Well, it gives pops a break too. He doesn't want to have to go seven days a week. I'm sure. No, no. It's funny. He doesn't want to, but some reasons he does because he's still obsessed with tunas. You know. But it's nice to have like, you know, in the way that I look at it, because my wife thinks I'm crazy and my work ethic is insane. Like I just I literally will go fish for six months straight with maybe, you know, a few days off here and there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it's a finger on the pulse thing, like whether it's inshore and you're doing your, your you know, your bass fishing or your whatever you're doing inshore fishing or whether you're tuna fishing. But the finger on the pulse is like when you're out there every day, you know, you know, yeah, you just yeah. know what you need to do and know where to go and know where to be. And it's like if you, you know, that's what the hard part is when you get to the fall and you, you're blown out for four days. And then it's like, all right, let me figure this out. Like, okay, we're going to go do the things that we've been doing, but are they there? Or, you know, now we, we just, we were railing on them on a small tide and now we've got massive tides. Yeah. And they're not going to be there. You just know they're not going to be there. Right. So now you're reinventing yourself again type of thing. But your finger on the pulse, it's, it's, it's easier for me to go fishing every day. Way easier. It's everything. I'm yeah. way more tired when I sleep in. You know, yeah, but you get into day. that groove, like yeah. I mean, especially the the September the September part is hard for me because I do all my in I do I'm mixed bag I'm doing inshore and offshore, so not every day is getting up at three thirty in the morning and the you know looking at your guys' thing of the pot of coffee brewing in the morning type of thing like oh well, the Sears boys are up they're moving you know type of thing but you know it's not always like that but when September rolls around it's three o'clock every morning and I don't usually get home till five or six o'clock at yeah. night yeah. Same. And, you know, I eat, I go to bed and I don't even need an alarm. I mean, I set one, but I don't even need an alarm. I'm back up at three and we're out the door and it's repetitive and it's just, it's go, you go, 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 go. And that's what we do. Yeah. That's what, and that, and that's why you guys are good at what you do. And that's why, I, you know, I'm, I'm good at what I do too, because you've got a finger on the pulse and you're constantly, you know, putting in as much effort as you can. And that's why, you know, you guys are fine. You're going to find it more with you guys building up this clientele. Like I've got where yeah, it's all, it's all automatically. I get, I got guys that fish 10, 12 days a year with me. Like they'll spread so it out, sick. but they'll like, Oh, well we want to go togging in the spring. And then we want to do, you know, X amount of striper trips. And then we want to do some tunas and you know, just like, but Hey, yeah, that's a good phone call. It is. And I don't know those guys, guys like that. They'll, I'm like, Hey, Book, book at least four or five, you know, get, get, get some dates to me and lock it in. And as, as we keep on kind of rolling along, but we got a few guys like that. We've got a few guys too, that are like book six, eight trips and they'll cook for us in every yeah. single while. Oh, yeah. Dude, we got like, guys. Yeah. Just make sure you have the grill. But they bring their own grill yeah. with them oh, and yeah. all that stuff. And I was yeah. like, Oh, I got the meat sweats. <laughs> and I was like, what do you want for dinner? I was like, I don't even want breakfast tomorrow. You know? like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's like, I got this guy, Eric. Oh shit. You're, you know, you're, you're good. And I'll, and I'll even take some, I'll take some elk meat out or I'll yeah, take yeah. some venison. I'll, I'll throw, I'll throw a little bit in the mix and all that stuff too. Pokey but, bowls if we're getting into But you're going to have, you guys have more and more of that all the time. Yeah. Because of the way that you guys are approaching your business and doing that. Like those, those guys that are booking that many days, you're just going to, it's just going to keep happening. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it and just keep grinding. But yeah, dude. but the grind part isn't grinding to put the trips together. The grinding part is the fishing. Part. Correct. So I mean, you have to look at it from that perspective because obviously we're all here for our businesses and we want our charters and all that stuff. So, you know, for the out, people outside, people that are going to listen to this podcast and maybe they can gain and gain a little something from it too. But, you know, you're grinding because you're fishing every day, yeah. not grinding to pay the bills or try to f- figure out how to get bookings. Yeah. Yep. Um, Stay ahead of the curve. For sure. And dovetailing into your charters, any listeners that want to hop on the hindsight, how do they... Uh, get a hold of you so website, you, can, all that. you can reach out to me um uh, uh, the hindsight uh instagram page is hindsight sport fishing it's the same on facebook i will be honest that um you know the instagram definitely gets more um stuff from me because a lot of times like you, you, go, you go to transfer stuff over but facebook won't let you do videos and pictures or something right. so then the it's just stays on the instagram and i'm going on a million miles an hour and some of that stuff doesn't make it over and then the instagram is hooked up through my website which is hindsightsportfishing.com um and you know you can reach out from that but i mean that's social media is kind of the way that things are and um you know, that's, that's how the world turns these days. So we're easy to find. It's hindsight sport fishing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again. Yeah, thank you. Been uh, big fans and looked up to you for a while. And oh, it's been nice you. to sit down and have a good combo and hear some epic stories and learn and chit chat. So yeah, man. Appreciate it. Dude. Awesome. Thank you. Well, uh, glad and, to be here. Yeah, absolutely. We'll end this on OG's three words of fishing wisdom. Remember, you can't catch them if you don't have a hook in the water. Always trust your instincts. And the last one, you'll have to keep listening. Stay tight, everybody. Nice. Thank you very much for tuning in to the Seabros Fishing Podcast. If you would like more information about today's guest, our episode, and show sponsors, or if you want to order hats and apparel, please visit our website at seabrosfishing.com. You can also stay up to date in all the latest Seabros Fishing content and podcast episodes by following us on Instagram at Seabros Fishing. Finally, to book a trip with us through our family-run charter fishing company, please visit massbayguides.com or see our latest updates and fishing reports by following Mass Bay Guides on Instagram and Facebook.